Committee, which is due to health and safety reasons to be held virtually. This meeting is being recorded and will be available via the Council website to be viewed as soon as it's practical following the meeting. Everybody participating in this meeting will be accessing this meeting from remote locations. Please can everyone ensure that their mobile phones are switched off or on silent mode, please. Members will be receiving an electronic copy of the agenda. I will ask officers to present a summary of the key points for the record of the agenda so they can view it on the Council's website. Members and officers will be speaking at various points during the meeting and those speaking may switch their cameras on at that point. But I will ask them, with exception of myself as chairperson, at all times to keep your cameras and microphones switched off as this will help to minimise the background noise and interference and to ensure the connection remains as stable as possible. If any members and officers wish to raise a point or question, they should press the hands up icon on the screen hand at the side right right hand side of the microphones team window and I will come to you in the order I see the questions. Please lower your hand once you have finished speaking. The chat button will be disabled for this meeting. Please make sure your microphones until I invite you to do so do so. Officers and democratic services will be supporting the meeting and be monitoring the use of microphones throughout the meeting. When necessary they will mute these not being used. I would also ask that officers to introduce themselves as is when invited to speak during the course of the meeting. They too should ensure microphones and cameras are switched off when not in use. I will now proceed to the agenda business. Number one, any apologies for absence please? Thank you Chair. Um, Councillor Chris Davis is the only one I received Chair, thanks. Okay, that's great. Number two on the agenda, declarations of interest. Has anybody got any declarations of interest? Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm connected. Can you hear me, Chair? Yeah, I, yes, I can, Mr. Ken Ken Councillor Kendall. Yeah, well, there is one with the Hunters um, Ridge uh, application. As I say, I have been in correspondence with one of the parties over several months. Um, uh, so I've just I sought advice on this, and I think the general advice given is that I should not take part in the debate or the vote on this issue. Okay. So you've you, you've spoken to uh, Jane, the solicitor, have you regarding I this have, issue? Yes. Right. Okay. Well, she's given you that in, information, and I suggest you do the, what she's said to do. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. No other declarations of interest. Okay, thank you for that. Number three, can somebody formally move the minutes, please, of the 25th of the 8th, 2022, and second it? Second. 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 Thank you all. Right, number four is public speakers. So if we go straight to the agenda, oh no, sorry, let's go through it. There are public speakers on items page seven, page eight, page nine, and page 10. And I will come back to them in a minute now. Uh, the amendment sheet, can somebody uh, accept that, please? I'll accept it. I'll second it, Rich. Thank you. Thank you both. OK, now if we go on to um, the debate. Can somebody note that, please? Sorry, Rich, you cut out then. Can you repeat? Can somebody move? They just note the Development Control Committee guidance, please. I'll move. Second. Thank you, Tony. Can we, right. say, can we just say, Chair, we can't see you on camera? Oh, well, I tried to do it to make it more effective. I will come online now. There we are. I'm here now. Uh, can everybody see me now? No, Chair. I no. can see Mr. Hathaway. Yes, we can, I can see you. Oh, right. I, OK. All right. No, I can just see Mr. Hathaway. Yes, I know. I'm going to second. But could I, I ask not. Mr. Hathaway to just put his camera off, is that, if that's possible, please? Thank you, uh, Rob. That's great. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we go on to item number seven then, 
Hunters Ridge Brackler. I think we missed the amendment sheet, Chair, as well. I don't, um, no, no, I missed it. it. No, no, I missed no, it. excellent. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's okay, Rod. I'm on the ball, Rod. Good stuff. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Chair, it's yeah. Councillor Kendall here. Shall I leave the meeting and come back? Uh, that, uh, Jane, is that what you advised him? Um, as Councillor Kendall feels that he has um, a prejudicial interest, um, if that's the case, he should obviously leave the meeting for the, the consideration of this item. OK. Right, OK, you, you've heard the reply, Councillor Kendall, so I would leave the meeting. Yeah, will you, uh, how will you indicate to me that I can rejoin him? Mark Arnville, Mark Arnville will come back to you and tell you when you can come back in. OK, thank you. Uh, on, the, on my mobile phone, yeah? I would take it that's the way that Mark. Do you usually do that, um, Chair? We can actually click a, a facility on Teams uh, for him to join the meeting, so he'll have a pop up on his uh, computer. Councillor Kendall will. Yep. Oh, there we are. Okay, right. So, so I, if I leave this meeting now, yeah. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, we go to item number seven. Then you can see the officer's recommendation. Can, can somebody move it and second it, please? I'll move, Chair. Thank you. Can somebody second it, please? Second. Who said that, please? Richard Williams. OK, thank okay. you, Richard. Right, so it's been moved and seconded. OK, uh, Phil, I oh, know, hang on, let me just get this right now. Uh, the wrong one. Rodri, I think you're taking, Rod, you taking this, aren't you? Yes, we got speakers first, Chair. Uh, oh, yes, so that's right, the... sorry, yes, yes. Mr Ford the... is first. That's it. Mr Ford? Uh, yeah, can you hear me, Chair? I can. Mark, do you want to explain to Mr Ford exactly how he, how, what is the protocol now, please? Uh, yeah, yes, Chair. Uh, Mr. Ford will have uh, five minutes, and um, Craig will put up um, a, a stopwatch on the screen um, to show the the countdown of the time. Okay. When can when I you, begin? When you begin, Mr. Ford, it, 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 the clock will start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kim. Council. Uh, to be clear, we're not against Mr. Hooper having an extension. We are against an extension that negatively impacts the immunity and the immunity of the community. We object on the development on the basis of overdevelopment, the appearance of Terence housing, which is note 16, the degradation of the immunity of number 37, number 40 in the neighborhood. And community and immunity is for a community to decide. And 30 households in Hunters Ridge are saying this is awful and I saw who would want that. And that in itself contravenes section 2.3a through 2.3c. We believe it's a contrary to note 12. If you take the ground floor footprint alone, it is 126% of the original property. And note 12 states an extension should be in scale with the existing dwelling. Planning Aid Wales described it as an attempt to put too big a development in too small an area. It does damage local amenity. It is not in keeping with the surrounding properties in the area and the proximity and size of the development itself cause it to take on the appearance of Terence housing. And that is contrary to note 16. No side extension should have a design if repeated on the adjoining property that would create the appearance of Terrace housing. Neighbours agree with that. Mr Davis agreed with that in April. And a chain of houses, even by appearance, is detrimental community in Brackler. And why would 39 want to become a mid-terrace? We also object on the basis that it's suggested it is a single story in the submission, as confirmed by Planning Aid Wales, as defined by the Building Regulations 2010, the Oxford English Dictionary, it is not single story. And whether you describe it as two-story development or two-story dwelling, it is still two stories. The Supreme Court has ruled on this and said words should have their natural and ordinary meaning. And as such, single story should mean single story. And BCBC operate those rules through the through the building control. The development itself shows a distance of 9.8 centimetres on the brickwork from the boundary of number 37. It is not, it is zero. The roofing structure currently oversails number 30 and will continue to oversail number 37. Uh, number 37, I apologise. 
uh, and uh, that contravenes section 4.42. Uh, it should be contained within the curtilage, and if it's not contained within the curtilage, there should have been a submission stating why it didn't damage the immunity of affecting properties, and no such submission has been made. If it's built to the boundary, there should be a submission made which states why there is no alternative, why there is, why again, why it doesn't damage the immunity of the properties affected. Again, no such statement was, was admitted, and furthermore, a certificate B should have been issued for both this and the previous development, and wasn't. An extension that overhangs the boundary with the adjoining property are not advisable unless it showed they have no adverse effect on the residential immunity. This has not been demonstrated. Contravene section 4.4.1, eaves and gutterings. While they can oversail, uh, it requires permission and there's been no permission. The raised floor platform within the kitchen of 750 millimetres and the raised patio give both structures a dominating and intrusive view over number 40's garden. This is compounded further by a window set to view directly into number 40 at an elevated position, 5.6 meters uh, back from the boundary. And the suggestion of a 10 foot fence of a short range would, would uh, uh, negate this is quite frankly ludicrous and not likely to be enforced. And while agents may not have appreciated the slope, they are professionals and they carry liability insurance to cover such events. Why should adjoining properties be disadvantaged as a result of Mr. Hooper's professional's failure? It is contrary to note 11, where it states it should harmonise with those of the existing house. It's contrary to 6.41. A good extension will reinforce the character by appearing to be a natural part of the building. The size, shape, the position of a utility door set 45 centimetres above ground level at the front is not in keeping with the surrounding area. And it should secure the maximum degree of unity between existing and proposed development. And it clearly doesn't. Uh, it breaches condition one, it currently will breach condition two, and the suggestion you can enforce, uh, get over this by installing brick slips down a gap between houses which doesn't exist is quite frankly ludicrous. I would ask the committee to rec reject the recommendation by planning, enforce the previous submission, or work with those affected to deliver a common sense compromise. On a technical note, uh, I would suggest that the kitchen could not be um, submitted as, as uh, permitted planning development due to the height and length of it relevant to the proximity of the boundary wall because it's within two meters. There is a socio-economic burden now being placed on 37 and number 40 because of legal action and as I've mentioned before on several occasions of BCBC there is a cost to Mr Hooper. I'd like to thank now the people who have supported us, Planning Aid Wells, Roger North, Mike Evans, Christine Davis litigators, the ARC associate team, X-ray team and Sarah Murphy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Now we'll give the opportunity now to Mr. Hooper. Mr. Hooper, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, okay, Mark, can you go through the same process, please, for Mr. Hooper? Yes, Mr. Hooper, same process, five minutes on the countdown clock. Um, when you begin your speech, the clock will, will commence. Just, Thank just you. Pardon, could I just note, I've asked my wife to speak on my behalf. Unfortunately, my anxiety would not allow me to get through this, I'm afraid. That's, that's fine, whoever, yeah, that's fine. Hello, as Garrett said, my name is Emily. Um, I'm his wife. Um, he's the applicant of the planning application currently under review by the committee. I would ask councillors to carefully consider the assessments of the case officer who judges that the proposed development would not cause any adverse harm to neighbouring occupiers or the wider local area. During the initial consultation following the submission of planning in January 2021, it should be noted that only two objections were received by the neighbouring properties of 37 and 40. The outcome of this was a dismissal of the objections based on the grounds that neither were material concerns in line with planning policy. As explained to members and neighbours at yesterday's site visit, the vast majority of the completed build is permitted development not requiring planning consent. Only a very small portion of the extension therefore comes under planning control. Councillors will have noted that we have completed a significant amount of the previously approved, approved build and did so under the genuine belief that all works carried out were inside of agreed planning guidance. Barring one image within the originally submitted plans that did incorrectly show the elevation of the pre-existing outbuilding, all other aspects of the build of the extension of the property was to be carried out at the existing elevation of our dwelling. 
It should also be noted that as we progress with our build, members of the planning and development team within the council visited the site on several occasions following complaints raised by the adjoining neighbours. On two of these occasions, they found that the build was in accordance with approved planning. Having received notice of an enforcement case in May this year, the required amendments to the build were not necessarily made clear and therefore the help and advice of a planning consultant and solicitor was sought. Following this, we have worked in accordance to the planning guidance to ensure all possible actions have and will be taken to mitigate any material impact from the build. Namely, that the amendments specifically reduce the impact by stepping, down the, stepping the as-built roof down. This option was discussed and agreed with planning officers during the course of negotiations. Whilst invoking significant cost and delaying our timeline to completion, we understand that this is a requirement and fully intend to follow the necessary course of action. Councillors will be aware that a number of the objections from neighbours are not material planning considerations. All of the points raised have either been addressed by the amended plans and their resubmissions or as civil matters between the parties involved. It's worth noting that a party wall surveyor was appointed and consulted throughout the build and his recommended actions have been followed or are in the process of completion. During the site visit carried out yesterday, it was clear that emotions were running high but it was evident that subject matters raised fell outside of the planning committee and were again civil matters. On several occasions, references were made to boundary lines, but this should not be a point of discussion for the panel and should not be a factor in the decision made today. Also during the visit, you've been made aware of the block work that does not tie into the material requirements of the build, but it should be noted that amendments to this have been put forward in the form of brick slip. The question was also raised about erecting a fence to offer the required privacy to both parties involved and ensuring its maintenance and stability. It should be noted that prior to the commencement of our build, there were indeed fence panels previously in place between the two properties. However, they were removed at some point prior to the site visit by the occupiers of number 40. We acknowledge the stability required for the longevity would be ensured by not bolting the panel to a single skinned wall as previously placed by the adjoining neighbours, but would be solidified with a fence post cemented into the ground of the boundaries of our property. The subject of rainfall and guttering was also an area of distress raised during yesterday's visit, and I feel it is important to clarify that the appointed party wall surveyor presented two options to the adjoining neighbours. The first option was to reconnect the guttering to our property, and the second was for the, our contractors to lift the existing gutter, guttering on the property of number 40 to ensure that the flow of water links to an existing downpipe. The owners of the property dismissed, dismissed both options and we've been not able to progress the matter. Taking on some points that Mr Ford just raised, and we believe there is a precedent in the street for a development of this nature, with many neighbours having already built side extensions and rear extensions of similar and larger size. The, regarding the appearance of the terraced house, there is a clear gap between our property and the adjoining neighbour. This was agreed with the party wall surveyor and the agreement was signed by Mr Ford. In conclusion, councillors are politely requested to agree with the case officer that the planning approval with appropriate conditions should be granted as there are no material planning reasons to refuse planning consent. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Hooper. Thank you very much. Okay, Mark, do you, uh, thank you. Rod, before you move on, can somebody formally move the amendment for number seven, please, which I've missed off? And can somebody second it, please? I do that, Richard. Thank you. I second. I'll, thank you, Vice Chair. Open now over to you, Rod, please. Thank you, Jay. Just checking if my mic was on. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, for the purposes of the recording, my name is Rodri Davis and I'm the Development and Building Control Manager at BCBC. The application is referred to members at the request of the local ward member and due to objections received from local residents and Brackley Community Council. It was the subject of a productive panel site visit yesterday morning during which members were shown the application site and the development from the neighbouring properties. As explained in my report, it seeks to amend the plans as approved and the previous consent to regularise the works that have been carried out and to agree changes in order to limit any impact. The amendments were sought following an enforcement complaint relating to works not being carried out in accordance with the approved plans. And after realising that the 
proposed plans did not match the situation on site. The report includes the previously approved plans uh, and the latest proposed plans for the information of members. The flat roof extension to the rear will incorporate two sections to gradually step the height of it down and the mass of it down towards the height of the existing outbuilding that the extension links into. This will reduce the mass of the building on the boundary of 37 Hunters Ridge. The patio area to the back of the kitchen will be reduced to 600 millimetres above ground level, which is 150 mil below the floor level of the extension. In order to protect the adjoining occupied private garden area from being overlooked from the kitchen doors, patio area and from the ground floor bedroom window opposite, it is proposed to erect a two metre high fence for a distance of 3.7 metres along the boundary with Hunters Ridge to the south. This feature will be retained in perpetuity via condition. Members will note that the bungalow is located within a residential area where properties are generally of the same scale and appearance, with some having been altered and extended over time, including th numbers 37 and 38 to the north and numbers 59 and 60 on the opposite side of the road. The objections to the scheme have been summarised and addressed in the report. As explained yesterday at the panel site visit, the majority of the side and rear extension could have been developed under permitted development rights, although members should note that the PD rights, the permitted development rights uh, and their extents do not denote what would be acceptable, just what could be built without the need for planning permission. The application has been the subject of negotiations after it became apparent that the extension could not accord with the approved plans, mainly as a result, as I said earlier, of an inaccurate interpretation of the site's levels. It was eventually agreed that the new application would have to be submitted to address the changes to the scheme as built when compared to the approved plans and to sufficiently reduce the impact of the development on the adjoining neighbours. Although the rear extension is single storey, the floor level results in the adjoining garden being overlooked by the bedroom window and patio doors. As explained yesterday, it is not possible to uh, obscurely glaze or fix the bedroom window as it is the only window serving that room. The two metre high fence for a distance of 3.7 metres will sufficiently preserve the privacy of the adjoining occupier without resulting in any undue overbearing or overshadowing impacts. Brackley Community Council has raised concerns that there is a live enforcement case on the site. The application must be determined on its own merits and on sound material planning grounds notwithstanding the current enforcement case. Therefore, their comments about the credibility of and confidence in the planning department at Progenda are unfounded. The path retrospective application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to the following planning conditions as added to the recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rodri. Has anybody got any questions now from Rodri, please? Okay, um, Simon. So, yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Thank so, you. Um, looking at the plans, Rodri, I'm a, I'm a little bit confused by the, the, the plans. So at, at the back, at the rear of the property, um, there's a building that's marked as a as a garage. Um, but my understanding of the, of the plans is that the access to the garage would be where the utility bathroom and bedroom have now been built. Is, is that the case? Let me come into the uh, right, uh, councillor. Yes, that that is the case. There's a link between the bedroom as part of that single storey extension uh, along the side of the the property that links into. Um, I'll show you on the plan if I may now. Yeah. So, it, so my question is: is is that a garage or, or because there's there's no? No, it's not. Or... No, it's a, it's an outbuilding. It's an outbuilding. So, but it's marked as a garage on the plans. Yes. Yeah, originally the, the the parking area went down the side of the property and you could park in front of the outbuilding, but I don't think the outbuilding has been used uh, specifically as a as a garage for a number of years. So what what what's oh, so what's the garage used for now then? Uh, in fact, um, we had a look in uh, the yesterday, but it's effectively for storage for for the property. So it's so it's just storage. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's it's uh, uh, perhaps if if the applicants are in uh, still in the meeting, perhaps they can confirm that. But as far as we're concerned, that outbuilding has been there for a number of years. That's been used incidentally in line with the domestic use of the property. So how how they use that is is as long as it's of a domestic nature, uh, even if they use it as a um, you know like the the. The, the trend is now to use us perhaps as a uh, external office or home office so that sort of thing but it's as long as it's of a domestic nature in in conjunction with the property then there's no yeah, control so over our use of that building so the extension does have an entrance internally to it but also as we saw on site yesterday there's a door that uh, gives access to it externally yeah, from from the rear garden Maybe if the if the applicants could confirm that the use on the um, um, of that outbuilding, please. Yes, Mrs. Yeah, Hooper. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, it, as Roger said, it's used as storage and as a home office when my husband can't use the house because me and my my toddler are in here, so he goes out there for for privacy. Okay, thanks. I, I'm I'm just. Uh, what I'm what I'm just confused about at the moment is that that's a bit misleading on the plans, and I'm not sure that we can really describe these plans as being accurate when it's when it's on the plans as a garage which has no vehicular access whatsoever, um, and it's actually used for for domestic purposes as effectively as as an extended room to the house. So I. Think I, I I don't believe we can really consider something as a garage if if there's there's absolutely no way that you can get a car there. Um, am I allowed to speak? Sorry. Yes. Um, well, not to me, chair. It, I believe it was originally built as a garage when the house was built in the eighties. When we bought the house six years ago, it was not a garage, and there was another, I don't know, like lean-to sort of structure um that you couldn't get a car into so you would never have been able to get a car into it it's never been used as a garage by the previous occupiers or as as ours um it, sh it should have been described as an outbuilding um i think that would have made things clearer i, I agree i, I think uh, chair and, and councillor i think obviously we're, we're not intent it's not the intention of the applicant to still use it as a garage because obviously you can't reach it with a car so yeah. that's why the plan indicates three parking spaces at the front of the property to accommodate the the extensions to the development which is in line with our parking guidelines i think my, my point here is is that the plans are inaccurate um, the plans do, do not actually represent the, that the that building um, and when we consider these matters, we expect these plans to be accurate. We already have a situation where the the original application was inaccurate on on the height of the land. Now we've got a situation where the use of of individual pro, um, and parts of the building is, is inaccurate. So so I, I'm I'm finding it difficult to make a, a judgment and an assessment of a planning application which still has significant in, inaccuracies from the actual. Uh, um, position of the of the building itself, and when we make judgments around uh, a building, we we have to judge and uh, assume that the plans being put in front of us are accurate representations of the building, and and in this case, with that showing it as a specifically as a garage, I I, I don't feel that 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 this is a, a true representation of the property as as it stands. So it's clearly not accurate because it says garage and it's not a garage and the current house owners have never used it as a garage and could never use it as a garage. And officers understand that. Uh, that's that's why we've got the uh, parking layout to show the parking for surface parking all on site rather than on street. So, so my it, point it, is, Roger, it complies with the, the parking guidelines. Well, the point, my, my point is, Roger, we, we have to look at the plans as they're presented to the Development Control Committee. And the plans that you you presented to the development control committee do not represent the actuality of the building mm -hmm. itself. No, but any 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 person looking at those plans could see that there's no uh, reasonable way of accessing that building with a car because the extension is in front of it. So, so that that can I, is. Can I come in? Yeah, yeah. So sorry, Jonathan. Yeah, I think um, I think Rodri's sort of ex explained that that position quite well, and, and I fully understand the the issue raised by the. Um, uh, by Councillor Griffiths, but I, I think what we we have to be aware of, we've got an application in front of us. Um, it's fairly clear from the description in the report, it's fairly clear 
uh, from the site visit that we had yesterday, what is being proposed. Um, I, I think that the, unfortunately, the, the plans show it as a garage, but quite clearly it is not being used for the garage in or private motor vehicles. That may have been its original purpose many years ago, but it is it's clearly that's not the case now. Uh, I, I would say, Chair, that this 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 is a, a fairly minor issue that's not material to the um, to, to the application that's actually before us. Um, we can, if if um, if the member is 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 concerned, we we can um, on any consent we can we we can make that clear that it is not to be used as a, as a garage, notwithstanding the the plans. If if that makes it clearer, but I, I think from the, the description in the in the report from the, um, the, the the site that was viewed yesterday, I think it's it's fairly clear what we are considering today, uh, and I, I don't think that the the incorrect perhaps the incorrect wording of that um, the, that description of that building is is should be material to the determination of the application. Thank you, so, Chair. So just for clarification, Jonathan, it is the overall um, meterage of the extension a relevant factor in, in considering a planning um, a planning um, application? Well, well, yes, of course, and that 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 information is on on the plans and it's on it's in the in the detail is in the report as well. And so my, my question would be as the as this extension actually joins the existing house to the the, the former garage, which is now part of the overall property. Did, did you as planning as planning include the the square meterage of the garage when you when you assess this this uh, application as part of the extension? I, I don't understand the question. What 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 do you mean with the square meterage of the garage? What why why you ask? What what's what's, so, what's the the relevance there? Sorry. So whether so whether ga whether garage was a garage, it it is included in the square meterage of the house. Um, now that there are, an extension has been built, which links the existing property to the garage, and the garage is no longer part no longer considered to be a garage, then the size of the extension should now be considered to be the size of the building work, but then added to that should be the size of the square meters of the garage as well, because it is effectively part of the extension because it was not formally um, considered part of the square square meters of the house. Um, yeah, yes, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, what's what's on what's before members is an extension to the house, which does join with the existing building in that garden. And my question would would be when we when we when we consider that, have have we did we include the square meterage of the um, of the original of the original garage when we decided um, whether this was a permissible um, development or not? As well, part, well as, yes, as of course, yeah. Yes, we didn't. We didn't treat the application as if the garage or the former garage wasn't there. So, did you, so was it included as part of the extent the, the square meters of the extension? Uh, well, it's it's. I, I, again, I'm not quite sure what point you're trying to make, Councillor. The extension, so, the so new element of the extension, is one part of the development. The existing outbuilding is another part of the development. And yes, the two are now linked. Um, but the fact that uh, I couldn't tell you what the square meter is of that of the of the wall building is, I've I've not actually measured it. We could find that information out if you really wish. But what I'm point I'm trying to make is 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 the materiality of of that former garage linked to the um, to the the extension as 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 it built. Um, and I'm not quite sure what what that relevance actually is. So 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 the relevance. Um, thank you for you you are. Patients are with me, um, Chair. Um, the, the relevance is that when we, we there is guidance about how large an extension should be compared to the screen meterage, meterage of the original property. Um, when we make a consideration around that, we would have only considered, or uh, I believe you as a planning department, considered what was said on the plans about the size of the, the extension that was built. However, the effect mm. of building that extension and linking it to the former garage means that the the, the practical square footage of the extension is now the building work of the extension plus the original garage, which is significantly larger than the extension itself. And as yeah. such, I think that falls substantially outside the um, uh, the, the original um, application, which did not include that as part of the extension size. And my point, my, but my, my, my basic point here is that we've been presented with a set of plans 
on which we have made decisions. And those plans are are still inaccurate because they show that as a garage where we everybody recognises, including the house owner, that it's not being used as a garage, can never be used as a garage, but it's not being considered as part of the extension. So I, I think I'm I'm very concerned that because of the original inaccuracy of the first application, which has been continued into this second application without without correction, that we are still not ma- able to make a judgment on on this um, uh, on this application because it is it is inaccurate. And part of the reason why we're trying to figure out here um, um, a, a very difficult situation was because of inaccuracies on the ground height. Um, so my, my concern here is that at no point has Development Control Committee been presented with an accurate set of plans for this property already, either originally or now. And I, and I think I, can, I cannot see how we can pass a, um, a, an application which is still clearly inaccurate by indicating that a substantial square meterage is indicated on plans as being a garage which has not been used as a garage in six years and can, can never be used as a garage. So, th- th- so these plans are by, by, uh, by definition inaccurate. And so I cannot see how we can um, accept a set of inaccurate plans and an inaccurate application. Uh, if I can come in there, I, I yeah. think that there's sufficient information for the committee to make a reasoned um, decision on this application. The com- members of the committee visited the site yesterday. They've seen the site conditions. The description in the officer's report is accurate. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the, what the member is suggesting, whether he's suggesting a refusal or, or not, but I, I, we would need to have some significant grounds to sort of go down to, to, um, to actually do that. But I, I, my advice to you, Chair, is that there is enough information on this application before members today to make a reasoned um, uh, a decision. Hey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Thank you, Rodri. Right, can we just move on then? Councillor Clark? Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I can I just um, clear up something? Because <coughs> Jonathan has mentioned it twice that members um, visited the site yesterday. I want to make it clear that it was a panel visit, not a, a, a full site visit. So when um, Jonathan is saying members, of course, it was only yourself, the uh, vice chair, and the third third member. Uh, I'd like to clear that up because it has been thought that it was a full site visit, and it and it wasn't. Um, but um, I, I must admit, I'm, I'm having difficulty understanding this planning application, um, the before and the after, if you, if you like, to put it uh, quite simply. Um, I've got t- t- two queries. One, one is the boundary. Um, it mentions under response to representations received that the projecting rear extension whilst being constructed close to the boundary uh, with the adjoining occupiers, or well, when we say close to the boundary, how close are we talking? Are we able to walk down between the boundary? Are we able to take a wheelbarrow down between the boundary? How uh, how wide is the boundary? And the other problem that I've got uh, uh, understanding is the the first objector mentioned uh, a two story building. And yet we're being told that it's only a one story building so um, or an extension. Um, uh, I really need to understand the boundary and and the um, the story. Uh, please. Thank you. Um, th- thank you, Chair. I think I think Rodri can clarify the, the point regarding the, um, the, 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 the the difference you know, the distance between the boundaries and I, and, yes. and I think Rodri's had some d- discussion as well on, on the um, w- whether the, the, the side extension is, is, is single or two storey. I think where the, um, the objector has pointed out is that although in appearance it, it looks like a, a, um, a single storey extension and it does actually have um, accommodation within the roof space. And now um, I think that that's what what the 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 objector was uh, what was was um, re- referring to there. I think what we've got to look at is is the the physical uh, the physical impact of that building, whether it's a classed as a one story or a single um, a one and a half story or a two story. It's the actual the physical impact. That's what's the important thing. That's what the important consideration is here. But I, I leave um, Rodri to um, 
to, to perhaps explain a little bit more on that? Yes, by all means, I'll, I'll bring up the plans now, councillors. So effectively, uh, the extension does fill up to the boundary with the neighbouring property. This matches up, so this element of the neighbouring property wasn't there in the first place either. So that's been extended out onto the boundary themselves. So there is a small gap in between. There's no no such thing as enough of a gap there to get your bins and walk around and et cetera and down there. But that uh, is the case on this one. There's, there's a utility room which then leads on out, out. You can go through the kitchen out to the garden. So, so effectively, that has been built up to the boundary, much in the same way as the neighbouring property at number 37 or 38 as it was. It's now one property with extensions, both sides of that semi-detached pair of properties. And effectively, it's up to the boundary with that property. Obviously, there is some debate about whether it, actually the next door property overhangs this uh, boundary or the extension uh, comes underneath the overhang of the next door property. So, so there, it is a matter, a civil matter between the parties to to resolve that, and that has been investigating, investigated by the party wall uh, um, surveyor. So that's out with the planning process. But in terms of the extension, it has the appearance. The, well, these bungalows are effectively single story with loft accommodation so the only property with actually actual dormer windows so projecting dormer windows in this street is the next door property every other property tends to have roof lights uh, to obviously to give light to the bedrooms in the loft so if you look at it as a pair of semi -deta semi detached bungalows still looks like a bungalow this is an extension onto the side of the bungalow which goes projects beyond if this was, I think it's about 1.8 metres lower than, than the ridge height as it is, then it would have been permitted development as a side, single storey side extension to, to the property. What uh, John was intimating and the next door neighbours intimating is the fact that obviously in line with the bedrooms at the first floor level, uh, within the roof space, there will be access to an ensuite facility but also within the roof space there. So on the back, as you can see, there'll be a roof light there to match the other roof lights. There's no projecting windows or anything like that. So effectively, if at the most, it would be deemed to be a one and a half storey element, much the same way as the bungalow is now. So taking you through that extension. So like I said, that would have been deemed to be permitted development if it was slightly lower. And likewise, it's this element, members, if you can see that on the screen, I hope I'm presenting. It's this element there that links into the garage uh, or the outbuilding, let's say that, is the element that requires planning permission because this is below, the extension to the kitchen is below four metres and is less than four metres in depth projecting out from the kitchen. So it's this small element effectively this bit there that causes this uh, extension to require planning permission and likewise the slight increase in height on this on the side extension um, to provide that that ensuite within the roof space. So, are so we, are um, we, sorry Roger are we saying that that's like infill between between the back of the bungalow and the garage it's like an infill is that what you're telling us? But yeah, yeah, but this this, this extension here, if, if it if the extension stopped there and didn't go into the outbuilding there with this projection for the bedroom or the second half of the bedroom, then that would this single story element at the back would not need planning permission because it because it would be permitted development. Right. Can I can I just ask then? Because obviously we were talking weren't we yesterday about amenity space. Yes. <laughs> Um, there's sufficient okay. space uh, there is. The, the panel side business saw on the site yesterday is sufficient garden space retained at the back okay. like John said earlier this is an existing building so it's yes. not taking up it's not taking up more garden space than it did uh, this was uh, a, a sort of a, a shared storage area so it wasn't private amenity space and likewise in between the two properties you wouldn't have been able to sit out there or 
or have a patio or anything because obviously you were shaded by your own property and the, the property next door which has been built yeah. up to the to the boundaries itself so it's it's yeah. it wouldn't have been it would have been just a uh, an alleyway um that wouldn't have been very suitable for any outdoor garden purposes but there's sufficient there's the decking area at the back of the outbuilding and sufficient garden space at the back of the property to serve this limited extension to this property can i, can I just ask then because this there's uh, it's taken right up to the boundary i mean I, i'd have to ask is that allowable to be quite quite frank um how does the occupants um manage to get out of the back garden is it only through the property yeah through the kitchen and, and that's uh, it so yeah. they right no, the it, utility room yes right so uh, if anything happened they wouldn't be able to you know say they were blocked off uh, at the front of the house how would they get out uh they Except, would go through the, through the property it's uh, it's 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 not a case of a uh, block him really it's uh it's uh it's no not... i mean if there was you know i mean if there was a fire or something like that i mean if there was a fire say they... in the front of the property how yeah, would they're... they get get out of the building they you know how escape... would they get out yeah they'd escape out to the back garden oh they'd be in the back garden yeah and they'd have to wait there till somebody came and rescued them well they they, they go beyond and 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 further out into into the area so it's as you can see there it's quite a lengthy garden probably the lengthiest compared to next door number 40 as well perhaps the longest garden in the yeah. in the row of properties the these the this property at the back next door is number just number 37 now but it used to be number 37 and 38 so that's probably got a big garden but it's only because they've obviously converted the two semi-detached bungalows into one property with dormer windows and extensions either side so as you can see that's right up to the boundary there pretty much up to the boundary to the north as well so that's filled that's almost created an effect of terracing itself as well but with the setback and the set down of this ridge as you can see there's quite a bit back from the front building line so as you're driving along there you won't really notice this until you're right in front of it so it's not as if it's an obvious terracing impact it's more of a case that it's a, a drop down set back extension to the side of the property much in the same way as they've done on the, on the adjoining property okay thank you i'll let somebody else come in thank you very much thank you chair thank you thank you uh, councillor clark councillor williams please martin williams thank you chair i've got two sort of little batches of questions first, first thing just for clarity here and i think perhaps the the committee i don't know if we, we're getting that slightly confused the, the, this application is about the relaxation yeah it's not about the the um the, the um extension itself which has previously been approved so so can can one of the officers explain to me exactly what exactly what is changed here because we've had some representation that's saying that materially there's nothing changed apart from that fence so can you explain exactly why it was non-compliant before and why you believe this is compliant now and, and along those lines i don't understand you know which is right as well so so is is because there's no absolute levels on you everything's relative to the house so is the extension at the level it's meant to be and it's the outbuilding that's lower than was anticipated or is, or is, the, or is the extension too high in absolute terms so you know materially does that make any difference but also what exactly has changed here and and i the other thing i, I the point i'd make is at what point was this brought to us was it brought to us through enforcement or when or did, or did the, the householder realise there was a problem and then seek advice? Because again, you know, as, as, a, as in a previous committee meeting, that does have a bearing on how I consider these things. Yes, thank you, councillor. I'll just spin you through the details that are included in the report. Effectively, under delegated powers, we approved uh, this scheme. So as you can see there, look at the height of the extension of the back with a very uh, small difference in height to compare to the outbuilding, the rear, and obviously at that time it would have appeared that the bedroom window would have been at the lower level, matching the same sort of level as the outbuilding there. What transpires, obviously, there's the garden as a, the panel members could see yesterday, and everyone who was out yesterday could see that this slopes away. So the actual uh, 
outbuilding is at a lower level than the finished floor level of the kitchen. Obviously, with a kitchen, you can't have internal steps uh, going out into the extension. So you can't have a step down into an extension. So it has to be level uh, to comply with building regs. So what has actually transpired is, is that in appearance on those elevations, the scheme would never actually uh, look like um, what was shown on the elevation of drawings. Uh, so that's why the roof level of, of the extension was a lot higher than uh, what was shown in the plans and that needed to be regularized because it wasn't a true reflection of what was happening on site. So the, the, the discrepancy between what was shown in the plans and what is actually on site was picked up by um, obviously once the development was being constructed and obviously I think I've got a photo within the report uh, which shows uh, the partly completed extension which basically brought that to the attention of the officers and uh, that's that one side and that's the other side so as you can see there whereas this extension on plan would have been just a bit higher than the than the outbuilding it's obviously a lot higher because it's the height relative to the ground floor level of of the kitchen so that's why we've suggested and um, to limit the impact of the height of this extension in relevance to the adjoining occupier number 37 that this would be stepped down and then stepped down again to the to the outbuilding and that is what's been shown now in the plans so it hasn't been completed as that yet but that uh, is obviously dependent on uh, the decision today and then that the uh, applicant will um, be required to do this so it matches this steps down and then steps down again so it's more akin to what we approved in the first place. Uh, originally, the enforcement complaint related to the front, front side extension and discrepancies between that and, and uh, the approved plans. But to all intents and purposes, it was constructed in line with the approved plans as before. So as you can see, there's no difference from the front elevation compared to front elevation of, of the extension on the current plans. So that's where we're at. As time went on, we went out to visit both neighbours on both sides of the property and the applicant himself, and we discussed the issue and the discrepancies between the plans and what has been built on site. We understood that the kitchen could only be built at that level because obviously you needed the uh, uh, a level surface coming out onto the extension and this is now the position we're in where we need to regularize what has been built with this alteration with the fence panel on on this side of the property to preserve the the privacy of number 40 and with those changes it is acceptable from a planning point of view thank you Gus. thanks I, I've, I've got another question but first of all a clarity point of clarity the levels haven't changed, have they? Because the level is correct, because the level of the extension is still relative to, to the, the thing it is it is extended extended onto is the house and the level hasn't dropped. Has it? So it's in, in some senses that the level was correct, because, as you said, it has to come out a level with with, the, with you know, with yes. the existing floor slab. So that level is as per the original plan. Yes. What what is incorrect is that is that the the outbuilding was lower. So it's not the absolute level that's 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 wrong. It's it's the relationship between the two. That, and, and it's it's the interpretation on the plans compared to what the actual situation on site. Obviously, this is what we approved. So it looks like it's at the almost the same level as the outbuilding. That is not the case on site as built or as per the approved plans and that's what we're trying to regularize now retrospectively with this change that hasn't happened yet but will happen as part of the consent to step that down like i mentioned in my presentation and then get to that level of the of the outbuilding because as you can see the existing ground level would have sloped away like that and the, and the outbuilding is at the lower level 
than the ground floor of the actual building. Right. So, so my second point, then, given that the the absolute level of that uh, high point of the extension, if you like, it hasn't changed. That window would have been the same height. The patio would have been the same height. Nothing's nothing's materially changed. What, what's changed is the end bit where it steps down, which I would argue is a is an aesthetic bit. Um, we've had representation. Those on this committee will know we've had we've we've had emails and, and all sorts, and, and including within that, we were sent a video. Now I won't go into the detail of that. But the video suggests that during an enforcement visit that officers felt that it was overbearing and, and there were you know, concerns with the as built extension. But nothing really materially seems to have changed so that I am slightly concerned that there's a contradiction between that video. And again, we have to take that on face value. We don't know how edited that may be and the report. So it seems to me that <laughs> nothing much has changed and, and, and there's that contradiction and that does concern me. And, and, and yeah, I am really getting a point on that. Rod, Rod, yeah. before, no, you, before, can... before, before yeah. you answer that to, to Councillor Williams, Mr Ford, you've put your hand up. Uh, uh, do you want to interject something here which is prevalent to the application? They've, they've spoken. Technical so. questions for Rodri, really. That, that's not the purpose of this meeting, Mr. Ford. Uh, you've you've right. spoken for five minutes, and that's that's the point. Uh, um, we we can ask, we can potentially ask you questions, but it's not the other way around. I, I thought it was up to the chair. Jane, sorry. Jane, hang on a second, Jane. What is it? Are it's they going to come back for Um, the protocol is that um, they speak we for don't, five minutes. Um, we don't allow um further comment from the objectors, but. The, the final decision would be with you, Chair, um, if you wanted any point of clarification. Right. Is this a clarification that, then, Mr. Ford? I'm being really generous here mm -hmm. on, on what is, is now being spoken about. And you've got, you know, don't go over the top here. No, Just no. clarify the point. Clarify. Um, Councillor mm -hmm. Nora Clark's comments. She asked how, um, how much relative the distance was between the two properties so i would just like to say just for her reference that number 40 um between us and number 39 at the like at the knee at the closest it's three inches and between number 37 it's zero it's a uh, it's zero um, that was all that, thank yeah, you yeah we just wanted to put that thank in. you so i'm just going to say this now for, for for everybody right as you as guests you cannot speak any more in this meeting okay and th thank you for, for for that intervention. Sorry, Roger, it's just a clarification. Okay. No, that's, that was irregular. No, thank you, Chair. Now I'll go back to Councillor Williams' point. Um, I suppose if we address the uh, the alleged video, um, at no point was myself and our enforcement officer Ruth Davis told that meeting was being um, put down on tape or being will be shared at all. Um, I queried the um, neighbour next door on that and she said it was on CCTV camera but that's obviously not the case. So I would suggest that members disregard that. Um, in terms of that meeting we visited the neighbours first so we had a look at it compared it to the plans that we had approved and obviously at that point it would have appeared that the extension was a lot higher than what was shown in the approved plans compared to that existing outbuilding. So at that point we would have um, assessed it as being out of keeping with the approved plans and not in accord with them. So a lot effectively, what I'm trying to say, look, looked a lot taller than what we had, we'd approved. We visited uh, Mr. Ford at 37 as well then and looked at it from that side. And then again, it didn't tie in with the outbuilding as shown on the approved plans. So when we went in to see the applicant, we discussed the matter with him and it became apparent then that the plans were not accurately drawn up to show the dropping levels between the finished floor level of the kitchen and the outbuilding. So that's what I'm trying to get through to you. It wasn't a case that it was uh, built bigger than what was shown in the plans. It was, show, it was the fact that the plans did not relate properly to the levels of the outbuilding and the levels of the garden sort of sloping away. So that is where we're at, and this is where we, we're um, trying to regularise that element. But in terms of that kitchen extension, Councillor Williams, like I've said before, that four metre extension 
less than four meters in height uh, extension, single story would have been permitted anyway. So they could have done that without any uh, need to apply for planning permission. It's that element of the bedroom that links the extension to the outbuilding that makes it require planning permission along with the uh, height of the ridge level of the extension to the side of the gable end. So, so that's, I hope that's clear to everyone on, on that basis. When we were around with the neighbours, it looked like to, to our naked eyes, it didn't tally up with the, um, the plans, but it wasn't the case of it being built bigger than what the plans approved. It was the case that the plans didn't uh, reflect the actual situation on site, and that's what we're trying to regularise now. So it is still the same size extension, but it's st and it's still acceptable from a planning point of view. Thank you, Chair. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, Chair. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Williams. Right, Simon, you've got your. Oh no, sorry, Simon. Hang on a second. Councillor Bennett, you've come back in. You was waiting. You went off. Simon has asked a question. So, Councillor Bennett, do you want to come in first? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a, a point of clarity. I, the previous question I had was actually answered. Um, it was uh, raised by uh, a previous councillor. Um, so just for clarity then, the original plans that came through to, to development control um, that were approved, um, we've identified they were inaccurate um, at the time, or at least the bill didn't didn't comply. Was that first question was, was there further consultation with residents at that point? Um, and secondly, the original plans that did not allow for um, any, I guess, space between the building on one side, if there is zero inches on, on one side of the building and three on the other, that I'm I'm asking for clarity. They were actually approved. We are development control allowed that to be approved. Is that correct? Rod, thank you, Councillor. Yes, yes, uh, effectively. Um, I'll answer the first question on the consultation. Obviously, we were made aware of the uh, apparent uh, discrepancies between what was being built on site um, compared to these initially approved plans, as you can see there, um, by the neighbours. So that's why our enforcement officer went out. Initially, it was, it was to do with this element at the front, the side. And then it, it was sec secondly to do with this, the rear extension, obviously, as the, the the extension was being constructed. So we've been in uh, contact with the, the neighbours throughout the process, and obviously uh, their initial uh, comments on the on the original application were incorporated into the officer's report and, and addressed. So likewise, We've offered with a section 73 application to amend the the approved plans on this application. We carried out the full consultation process, uh, the, the full notification process, uh, advertised it to the affected parties. Obviously, Brackley Community Council obviously have also commented on, and that's been addressed and summarised fully in the report. So, so everyone knows what's happening. Everyone knows what the purpose of this application is. And the second part of your um, question to do with the gap in between the properties. Yes, it was built right up to the boundary and it is the applicants and the agent and architects point of view that the building is within the boundary of the property. Um, but we did approve that uh, originally under the original application. And likewise, it's the same situation with the extension uh, to the side of the property with this application. So there's no change to that element. Does that answer your question, Councillor Bennett? Thank you. Yes, thank you. OK, thank you. Simon, I'll ask you to come back in then, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I've got a question about the enforcement that's, that, that's going on at the moment. My understanding is that the original application had a clause in it that, that required any building work to be done in compliance with building regulations. And so my, my question is that, uh, is is it building regulations that, that, that the enforcement is is um, going on about, or, or is it the, the planning regulations themselves? Thank you, right. No, they're two different pieces of legislation which, which don't 
have a bearing on each other. Uh, effectively, then planning enforcement was to do with the build and not being in compliance with or apparent compliance with the approved plans. So that's been held in abeyance, obviously, with the submission of an application to try and regularise that. Obviously, we're not going to take enforcement action until uh, this application has been determined and uh, uh, and and resolved. So, um, so that's why that's been held in abeyance. And effectively, uh, the building regs is a separate legislation, a separate issue, which there's an application in at the moment. Uh, the the area building control officer Adam Hewitt has been out. Uh, three or four times to inspect uh, the property is waiting for another uh, invite to go out to inspect uh, the construction as it's going along and obviously um, that will be part of his legislation and the building regs and under the building act and uh, any requirements he has will have to be complied with from a building regs point of view so so I uh, hope that satisfies your your question, Councillor. Yeah. So if, if I could just summarise, I think my, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, Chair, just to summarise. So what I'm seeing here is is very poor plans in the original application. I'm seeing still errors on existing plans um, to do with the the, um, the the identification of some of the some of the buildings which are now part of the property as being being a garage, um, and I, I, I'm. I'm very much not convinced at this point that we have been presented with a, an accurate set of, set of plans of what actually has been built, what was there previously. And I, I'm, from my point of view, I can't make a, a decision on uh, a, a positive decision on this until we get a better set of plans. So I wonder, to show whether it is possible for us to ask for a, a proper survey of this property to get a clearer view of exactly what is there, because I, I still don't believe from and it's evidenced by the the, um, the inappropriate um, de denomination as a garage of what part of the property, but what we actually have. So my 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 point here is that we still don't have sufficient evidence as a as a body to make a categorical decision on these plans. Rod or Jonathan, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I I think Jonathan answered it before. I think there's sufficient information on the plans okay there's a annotation issue with calling it uh, a garage i don't think it's been used as a garage or anything like that for a few years it's, it was obvious to us on on the site visit yesterday that that was the case uh it's it's sort of um muddy in the waters a bit about calling it a garage because it's it obviously can't be accessed as a garage and we're not even taking that parking space into it into account when we're assessing how much this extended property requires for and to comply with the parking uh, guidelines so so i don't think that is for want of a better word a bit of a red herring i can understand your point that the, you think that this obviously then creates additional floor space but that building has always been there it's not it's not additional floor space what what we're looking at is an extension that could be built uh anytime without the need for planning permission this a small element that is uh, a link between the two, uh, which doesn't span the full width of the of the uh, garden. So you can see there's the patio area there. So it's not as if the extension goes all the way across the width of the the bungalow. Links into the outbuilding, and there's sufficient garden space remaining to serve the extended property. So, so I think there's enough information there, and the, as you can see. Compared to what we saw on site yesterday, this hasn't actually happened yet, but it will happen once the decision is made to approve this, this uh, um, uh, these updated and more accurate plans compared to what's on site. So that's what we're trying to achieve here is to regularise it, make sure this is done, and then building regs will be a separate issue, but that will ensure that the construction and the finishes on the property and extension will be satisfactory under the building regulations. Thank you, Chair. Are you happy with that, Simon? Um, no, I, I don't believe I am happy with that statement, actually. I think if there are two buildings, which you then build a building in between those two buildings and you have walkway access through those three buildings, then it, it is effectively one building. And so I think for us to for to discount the garage as part of the extension, I think is a is wrong in fact and, and probably wrong in law as well. 
So, so, so my position is that we this does not I, represent the the actual the actual development I, itself. Jonathan, I, I come in, come in, chair. Um, I'm not quite sure what the council is saying about law. What you see in front of you, members, is what you were being asked to approve today. That is the extension, the the former garage. That's what's what's proposed. That is what you're being asked to 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 determine today. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I I, I well I, I can say definitely the, the the point of having a complete survey of of that property. I don't think that's going to add any value to the planning process. Um, at the moment, the, the the building is not complete, and what this application is doing is attempting to regularise um, what was being partially completed and what is intended to be finished, the finished article. So what you see in front of you is the finished article, and that's what you're being asked to approve. Mm. Um, yeah. And it's up to members whether they feel that there's that they, they wish to do that, but there is more than enough information in, in front of members today to make a reasoned decision. Uh, and I think delaying it um, is, is not going to um, it's not going to resolve any of the issues that have been discussed today and have been raised by the objectors. Um, but at the moment, that building is a state of flux. It's not been completed, and we're waiting the outcome of of this application to so so things can go forward. Uh, but I'll reiterate again, I I believe that there's enough information here, chair, for members to make a a, a reasonable decision on this. Okay, thank you for that, Jonathan. Simon, I'm going to. If somebody else wants to ask a question, so. Councillor Clark, is this is this a separate question or clarification on a point? It's it's not a question, Chair. I just wanted to ask uh, that we are asked individually to vote on this rather than a yay or a nay. I think there's been quite a lot of uh, discussion on this and uh, and quite a, a, a little bit of um, uh, uncertainty, if you like. So I I would like to be uh, uh, you know that we're asked individually how we'd like to vote. That that, that that's that that's fine, Mark. Can you do that then, please? Yeah, if there's any uncertainty, Chair, by all means, ask the questions now, and then we can answer them, and, and members can make the decision based on that then, rather than uh, guessing if there is any uncertainty there. So uh, any answer to the questions there, I will answer them. So, sorry, I, uh, um, let me uh, just explain that. I meant, you know, from from members, not not there's, uh, you know, or you've answered you've answered all the questions. But what I meant was that, that there were uncertain, you know, uncertainties and you and you answered them. Okay. I didn't mean that there were any still remaining. As such. OK, OK, thank you. Chair. Thank you, Council. Yeah. Uh, right, Chair, so, uh, Mike will uh, call out the names of the members in turn now. Um, as I understand, it's it's for the application, the recommendation or against. Yeah. There's been no amendment that no. that I've heard of that's been no. moved or seconded. No. So it's for the recommendation uh, or against the recommendation. Uh, so Mike will read out the names in turn. Can I just make the point, Councillor Alex Williams is observing. He won't take part in the vote today. Yeah. Um, and then the legal officer, Jane, will will tot up and announce the result. Thank you, Great. Chair. Thank you for that. All right, Michael, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Anthony Barrow. For. Councillor David Harrison. Sorry, Councillor David Harrison. I didn't didn't catch. catch oh, that. sorry. Uh, against. Thank you. Councillor Della Hughes. Against. Councillor Heidi Bennett. Against. Councillor Jonathan Pratt. For. Councillor Mark John. Against. Uh, Councillor Martin Hughes. For. Councillor Martin Williams. Against. Councillor Nora Clark. Against. Councillor Richard Granville. For. Councillor Richard Williams. For the recommendation. Councillor Simon Griffiths. Against. That's everyone, Chair. Thank, uh, th thank you. Chair, that's um, five members have voted in favour of the recommendation and seven 
voted against the recommendation. Jonathan, do you want to come in now and explain the protocol? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. The, the, the protocol now is that um, uh, members have voted to refuse the application. Um, we don't have any reasons for, for that refusal, and it is now for members to formulate that those reasons for refusal and to bring this back to the next meeting of the Development Control Committee um, for those reasons to be um, uh, highlighted. Um, it's uh, in, in where members go against officer recommendation, uh, then it is a matter for uh, for, for for members to nominate um, a, a member of the development control committee to um, actually lead the the subsequent appeal if it comes forward. Um, so members may wish to do that today and nominate a, a member of the committee to act as the lead on the planning appeal if it um, if it uh, comes forward. We got a nomination. Could I nom nominate um, Councillor Simon Griffiths, please? I second that. I'll okay. accept it. I'll accept that, Chair. Okay. So we've got that. So Simon, can you come back to the next meeting then with your formal objections to this application? So then it can go to officers and then they can deal with it. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. OK, just just thank you, Chair. Just to remind members, if you are making uh, reasons for refusal, they have to be on sound planning grounds. Um, they, that, 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 they, they can't be on anything that's not a material planning consideration and they must be demonstrable. They must be able to evidence the reasons as well. Uh, so that's that's the advice I will give you. Um, officers in this meeting, we, we are hostile to that process because we've recommended approval. Um, but if you would contact me after the meeting, I'll, I'll see what I can arrange with um, with officer support in, in formulating those reasons. Well, I'm sure Simon has just heard that, uh, Jonathan, so he can do that after the meeting. Councillor Hughes, Mark, um, Mark, you put your hand up. Yes, th thank you, Chair. It's a um, question, I think, to Jane on, on this one. Um, I'm just noting that that was a majority decision. It wasn't a unanimous one. And uh, five in favour, seven against. Um, where do we stand in terms of that sort of um, result uh, as compared to one that where the, the committee we unanimously have one view? Well, the, the, the position in respect to the vote is it's on a simple majority. Um, so that the uh, majority of members voting voted against the recommendation. OK, Chair, I, I think I'll have to um, give this a bit more further consideration, but uh, thank you for that reply in the meantime anyway. OK, thank you, Councillor Hills. Sam, Councillor Griffiths? Yes, Chair, I wonder whether you could clarify for me what um, external help outside the planning department that we can um, um, commission to help us um, get, get a viewpoint on, on this particular situation. Yeah, well, uh... Jonathan, do you want to come in on that? Because I'm not a legal person, or I'm not a. <laughs> well. well, it depends on on Councillor Griffiths whether he's happy to take advice from from a, an officer that's not been involved with this case, or whether he doesn't consider that that's appropriate. Uh, otherwise, I you will have to seek your own independent planning advice. Um, but what what I'm offering is that I, I can provide some officer time to help you formulate reasons for refusal. Um, but they've got to be sound planning grounds. I understand. And, and if they're not planning grounds, then this this authority will be liable uh, to lose in any subsequent appeal. Um, and there may well be a claim for costs in that as well. Uh, I need to bring that to your attention. It's not a threat, but it is a possibility that if this uh, if if this does go to an appeal and it goes to a hearing, um, there, there could be there could be costs involved. 
Um, but that's all I can offer you. I can't put my name to it, neither can Rodri, because the, the recommendation in the report is to approve, and you, you members have clearly are not accepted that recommendation. So I, I, I couldn't. My, my code of conduct with the Royal Town Planning Institute wouldn't allow me to 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 um, to do that case for you. Thank um, you, Jonathan, for that clarification. So my my question, Chair, is if we decide to go to outside support. So, so thank you for the offer, Jonathan, and we may well take you up on that. But if we do go to an outside body for advice, which has a cost, do mm -hmm. do we have, as a development control committee, the ability to be able to pay for that support? We, we don't have a budget for that, no. I, so I think that, in the that's, first instance, that's, so that's, that's not quite yeah. what I'm asking, Jonathan. What I'm asking is, is it, is it permissible to, um, for us to pay for an external body to support us on getting a judgment? Uh, not uh, yeah, I was just um, say, what, it, prob it probably depends on, on what the reasons are. So you, you, you obviously wouldn't want a, a noise specialist if you, one of your reasons doesn't relate, for example, to, to noise. So it, it, you're probably going to have to um, compile the reasons or any reasons you have for refusing the the, the application and then you work from there but uh, until you till you till you agree what the reasons are then uh, there's probably no point of going out to a, an independent uh, consultant or, or or such like so it's it's a case of perhaps as as members you come up with the reasons then we give it uh, a bit of a sense check and then if if there's something there that you think that is uh, that has got legs then you could get uh, external advice from there Okay, thank you, Chair. I just want to check, Chair, that that no, no, that, that, that's fine. My understanding is, is better in this meeting than you going outside and coming back after. Exactly. My understanding is that with within the constitution of this particular committee, that we have the the um, the right to go to external bodies and to commission those. So, but what I'm really asking you, as Chair, I guess, is to make sure that we have some some funding available for us to be able to do that, because I feel that is part of our our purpose and our, our responsibilities as a, a as a committee uh, and, I would, and I would wish to fulfill those committees to the best of our ability. Well I'm sure I'm sure Jonathan has just heard you on that and I'll have discussions with Jonathan and the legal department and whatever we need to to make sure that we're doing it right our side. Thank you very much Chair. Uh, I, I, I haven't got any money Chair and you've heard me numerous times telling me how under-resourced the department is so. Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we'll, we'll, well, if that's what members want, we'll, I'll have to take it up with the, um, uh, with the, the head of service. Uh, right, John, can I, can I just to, make a point, Chair? Sorry, before we go, um, th there was an issue raised with video evidence. It was brought up by a member. Um, I believe that um, some members have been were, were emailed um, a video clip, um, which was not formally submitted to to the. It wasn't it didn't come through officers um, and it didn't come wasn't formally submitted to the to the department. Um, and it's it's what weight the members want to attach to that. But um, can I ask the legal officer to come in and make a comment on that, please? Certainly. Jane? Chair, yes. The um, video footage that was submitted um, due to the, the nature of the um, submission, we were unable to accept that. And those member um, members who did receive it were told to disregard it for the purposes of the the application. Oh. Right, Jonathan. So, what 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 point are you trying to make here, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, it, no, can't, thank you, Chair. It, it can't be used uh, no, in evidence. No, 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 no. It, it's uh, oh, sorry, wrong, Jonathan. Sorry, go on, carry on. Sorry, Councillor. Uh, it, it's more. To no, do it, it. I think it was just a point of clarity. Um, is right. That it was okay. it was brought that, up, um, right? But it's what weight members should have attached to that video evidence. I believe that members that did receive it were advised that it's, uh, as a legal officer said, that it it was not material um, to to this particular item. Right. Okay. Thank you for that, Councillor Pratt. I do apologise for for holding you back, but if you want a question now, please come in and answer. Ask a question. No, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Sorry for the confusion. Too many Jonathans in the uh, in the meeting. <laughs> um, we we do find ourselves in an interesting position. Um, obviously, it was voted against seven to five. That's fine. That's democracy, and and we move on. But I I, I am struggling to understand why members voted against it because no real reasons were given. Um, if this does go to appeal, um, is there a mechanism for 
any of the five members who voted for the application to voice their opinions in that appeal, or would we rely on officers to do that? Jonathan? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's um, it depends on what 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 a, if if an appeal comes forward. Not saying that it will. If an appeal comes forward, uh, then it could either be in a written form, uh, which is an exchange of written communications between um, the authority and the and the appellant or the applicant. It would be the applicant in this case and, and the applicant's agent. Um, if it goes to a hearing, uh, then there will be a need for um, for members to um, give evidence effectively to 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 a planning inspector um so it it depends on what 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 appeal comes forward if it's written representations it, it will be um, an exchange of written communication so it wouldn't be a need to um to actually appear and, and give evidence but it depends on on what what procedure is chosen by the um uh the the appellant or the applicant in this case is that okay for you councillor pratt yeah, no, that, that that's fine. So if if the applicant appeals, um, they would um, we 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 would uh, a written format would be dealt by officers. Uh, a verbal um, consultation would have a, um, a a a a more open hearing. Yes, um, I think I think I'm making my point. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to clarify that it it the the written procedure would still be, there still be member involvement in that, and it depends on on what members wish to do with. Uh, if, if they if they don't want officers to 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 assist in that process, then there's nothing I can do about that. But it would be the the, the correspondence would be between this authority or the, the local planning authority, um, which the committee is part of, and the uh, and the appellant, um, and that that would be an exchange of of, of written communications. Uh, but the the officer involvement is now it's, it's in, I'm in the hands of members on that. It's um it's what they want to do. OK, well, if just here, Jonathan. <clears throat> Simon, what do you want to do? Um, I, I will speak to the other the other seven members that voted against and we'll we'll discuss what our, our process is from from there. So and we'll seek out the support of, of both legal and planning department to to make sure that we present the, the case appropriately. OK, oh, the director wants to come in now. Uh, Janine. Yes, good, good afternoon, Chair, and good afternoon, Committee. I, I've been sitting in the wings listening as I, I knew this was um, might have been a, a very difficult application. So if you wouldn't mind, I, I would like to just uh, provide some support of, of, of my own views. I am a, a chartered planner myself, but just for the purposes of the recording, I'm Janine Nightingale, the Corporate Director for Communities. So what I've witnessed today, it's uh, we've had a debate. Um, but what is clear, if I may say, Chair, is this is a recommendation for approval by the planning officers. What it is, albeit I understand it was a fairly complex diagram to look at, what it was an application for was a regular regularisation of, of a planning application submitted. And the issue was the roof line. If we get down to the to the real issue is that the roof line wasn't built as was shown on the plans. And so suggestions have been put forward for how the roof line can be changed so the application can be approved. Mm. No other material consideration could be taken into account here. We can't take into account the video because it was it was taken uh, without permission and you've heard from the legal officer about that. So please don't take that into account. And then the officers have explained the situation. And it is your right as a development control committee, and you are right, that if you if you've gone to a vote and you have voted against the recommendations of the planning officers and it is in, in within your right to do that. But the difficulty that we now face is as planning officers, we cannot assist now going forward or within our directorate support financially you in in any uh, more decision making you need to make in terms of the planning process. And that's something the chair can go and check on that. But in terms of myself as the director, unfortunately, I'm going to confirm everything Jonathan has said at this stage because you're going against the recommendation of a planning officer at this stage, I'm afraid um, it is difficult for us to have further involvement. 
And what I would also say is please do go away and please do consider what your reasons are for refusal and then come back and again discuss them with us. And there's two options here. You may still want to go ahead and refuse that application and have your reasons to do so. And that's absolutely fine. And that is your choice. That is your choice as part of this Development Control Committee. Or you may go away and come back and things you might feel slightly differently. And that's your choice as well to go away. So please do take that time now until the next committee and come back with reasons for refusal. Again, importantly, as Jonathan um, has pointed out, they have to be material considerations. And also what you need to, to remember at this point is that those refusal material considerations will be what will be used in any appeal situation. And any uh, inspector who's appointed to look at that appeal will look at those material considerations and will determine the application on that. Now, what that report, any report that goes to that inspector will say that the recommendation of the planning officer was approval and that the Development Control Committee voted against and these are the reasons for. So the inspector will be cognizant of that at that time. So what I would urge you to do now is to have some very strongly defined reasons for refusal based on planning evidence going forward. And then, of course, when it comes to the, the, the planning appeal, if an appeal goes forward, as John has said, if the inspector does find um, in favour of the application and doesn't accept refusal, then we may face costs as an authority because we've overturned that decision. So I just wanted to to say from from our point of view, um, everything that John has said, just to reinforce the process. But what I would urge you do, to do now is to go away um, and, and seriously consider some very, very strong uh, reasons for refusal for this per, this development, this permission, based on the fact that when we take all things into account, the part of that application that is different is that the roof hasn't been built in accordance with the plans. OK, that's that's the bit that you need to concentrate on. That's the bit that I think that you from the conversations I've heard you're, you're having difficulty with. All other issues at this point are probably not material considerations, but but that is for you to to um, come up and decide. So I hope that just assists you in some way and provides a little bit of clarity and support for what the officers have said. So thank you for that, Chair. Thank you, Janine, for coming into your, your intervention. Thank you very much. Right, you've heard that, uh, what the directors just said. So obviously, go away, do what you have to do, and then come back to the next meeting uh, with your uh, points against the application. Uh, and Simon, obviously, that will be down to you, obviously, as the representative they've asked you to do. Right, we've finished with that now. Let's move on. We'll draw a line under that now. And if can we go to item eight then, please? <clears throat> and can somebody move the officer's recommendation, please? I move, Richard. Thank you. Can somebody second it, please? Chair Jane has a hand up. Oh. Oh, Jane, sorry, Jane, I didn't see it. Sorry, Jane. Chair, I just wanted to make sure that Councillor Kendall had been brought back into the meeting. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Is he, is, has he been yes, brought he's back been brought, Yes, he's been, he means someone to come back in, Chair, thanks. Yeah, okay. thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, can somebody second the proposal then, please? Second. Thank you. Uh, we've got two speakers uh, on this application on number eight and mark are other two people here ready to speak miss miss thomas and i take it uh Kerry griffiths i, I believe uh, they yes. are chair. i believe they are chair yeah um i made it to say my name earlier on apologies for that i'm mark galvin senior democratic services officer committees um so the objective will go first um mrs thomas or miss thomas yes yeah. uh minford road application uh, Ms. Thomas, you'll have five minutes on, on the countdown clock um, and the, the officer will commence the clock as soon as you commence your speech. Thank you, Mark.
Good morning. I'm hoping to gain something today to help people understand the many issues up here with this planning problem we have. Because again, um, we've seen promises after promises after promises on the ba basis that the BCBC highway safety have always been concerned for us, but have always been overruled by planning. So I guess we start again, don't we? But I am hopeful, having seen the way you all enthusiastically debated the last one, that perhaps we have more hope this time. They say there's no traffic here in Minfrood Road. I see close calls all the time myself. One of my neighbours is sending photographs to um, your planning department to show the very, very dangerous issue out here where two drives come out with very little visibility on my side of the road. When children are about, we've seen actual accidents, not accidents waiting to happen where a child got knocked over on the cross of Pentoin Road and Minfrood Road. The people from close Penglin themselves complain because uh, they say there's no space here to pass, the site is an eyesore, and their car cars are scratched by um, overgrowth. The home and the number of cars on close Penglin alone at the home are just, you know, 12, 15 is nothing to say nothing of all the private homes on close Penglin. They have pavements and we have never had pavements. I personally, when I first started supporting Steve Lewis in his campaign here, I had two small children in a double buggy. Now I'm one of the pensioners that I was campaigning to get the pavements for. And um, about 18 years ago, I had to use the disability bus myself. And the danger here, um, you know, we've now got a disabled lady across the road, absolutely adjacent to this new site. Um, and I had, um, you know, I've had necessary problems with Tesco deliveries, disability buses. And to be honest, we've had so many cut and run speculators on this site. We're just literally in despair. I think that for older people like myself and Mrs Watkins at number 12, it's quite scary. But the children around here, their parents are very concerned and quite rightly so, because it means that the promises that the Bridgend Highways people promised us that never would drives come on to Minfrood Road itself. Now, I don't know if I've under misunderstood this latest plan, but it looks to me as if three of the four drives are going to be coming onto Minfrood Road. And to be honest with you all, I just have um, so much news about this plot is that the size of it is totally inaccurate. If you look at it from my home at number 34 Minfrood Road, to the right-hand front, there's a telegraph pole and we used to be able to park behind there because the wall went round behind that. And actually, of course, the various speculators knocked the dirt down, tried to make the plot bigger. We've had all sorts of problems. And of course, we've had inadequate time for monitoring traffic. Um, part of Minfrood Close itself that these people say they're going to tarmac is, I believe, privately owned. How will that consultation be done? The rest of poor Minfrood Close, despite paying full rates, they never, ever have had their place adopted in terms of a road. The site is simply not consistent with earlier plans that we can access from MAC people, especially front rights. If I think... Um, the highway conditions on the latest plans are anything to go by, that they also have gone down in numbers. So I hope that's for a good reason that the highway conditions actually have found something. Can I say safety, please? Safety. It's so bad here. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss 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 Thomas. Thank you. Can we now have uh, Kerry Griffiths, please, to speak for five minutes, please? Yes. Clock will start when you when you start speaking, Mr. Griffiths. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to speak in favour of the application before you. I don't intend to respond directly to the issues raised by the previous speaker, as I believe they've all been fully addressed in the planning officer's report to committee. This is recommended approval on clear planning policy and highways grounds. I only wish to make two general points. Firstly, the application before you is identical to the previous scheme that was approved in 2013, but with two significant differences. This proposal, if approved, includes off-site highways improvements, which will provide, significant, provide a significant benefit to active travel infrastructure in the local area and traffic movements. In addition, the proposal can and will be delivered by this applicant. It has been fully costed and all technical issues that affected the previous approvals that didn't proceed have now been resolved. Secondly, we're all acutely aware that the chronic shortage housing source shortage in Wales and the UK as a whole. This shortage of both market and affordable housing is raising house prices and making it increasingly difficult for future generations, our children and their children, to afford to get on the housing ladder or even rent suitable accommodation. The upcoming LDP for Bridgend identifies that there is a need for over 7,500 new homes in the Bridgend area alone. Whilst four houses won't make a significant dent in this number, it will, in a small way, help achieve the required number of new homes. Every new home built now, large or small, market or affordable, creates a chain that eventually results in additional opportunity for a first time buyer or renter. Every home built on a brownfield site within an existing settlement reduces the pressure on our countryside and green spaces. This is something that has a benefit to us all as a society. The upcoming replacement LDP in its sustainable housing strategy recognises this fact and clearly prioritises the delivery of new housing on sites such as this. To close, the proposal before you will deliver much needed housing on a site within Pencoid, whilst at the same time providing highways improvements to the wider area. It will help deliver the required number of homes within the Bridgen County and is entirely in accordance with all published planning policy. And I hope that for these reasons, it will be supported by members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Griffiths. Bill, are you the officer taking this? Thank you, Chair. I, I am indeed. Um, just bear with me. If it's OK, Chair, I might just leave a plan of the site on the screen for members' consideration, if that's OK with you. Yes. Yeah, thank uh, you. Chair, Chair, pardon my interruption. Um, I unfortunately couldn't get uh, in on the first item on the agenda, and I want to actually declare an interest. Um, and uh, an objector is known to me, and I also took part in two of the decisions uh, which have been listed uh, in the past. So I'm going to withdraw from the meeting uh, if, if you are OK with that. Certainly. Can you take your hand down, Councillor Williams, please? Thank you. Right, Phil. Thank you, Chair. Members, for the purpose of this recording, my name is Phil Thomas, uh, Principal Planning Officer and Case Officer for this application for the development of four detached houses on land at Minford Close, Pencoid. The application seeks to agree the principle of the development, but at the same time also agreeing the means of access and layout. As referred to by the public speaker, the site has a long planning history as detailed in the report, with the last consent being granted in 2013 for the erection of four detached houses in a layout very similar to the one that you have before you today, members. The consent was not implemented and subsequently expired. The latest layout plan is currently displayed for members and there's an extract at the bottom of page 23 of your report. As the public speaker rightly noted, uh, plots two, three and four of the proposed layout will have driveway and direct access onto Minford Lowe's, whilst plot one 
will have pedestrian access to the front, but vehicular access to the rear of the unmade road that forms part of Minford Close. Proposed improvements and widening along Minford Road are detailed on the layout plan as part of the access works and will include a 1.8 metre footway on the development side, as well as limited works to the junction with Minford Close. A small lay-by will serve plot one to cater for calling vehicles. The application does not propose to upgrade Minford Close apart from the works at the junction, but does retain the required highway widths and turning areas. At this stage, members, the final design and scale of the dwellings is unknown, although the parameters presented as part of the application suggest the dwellings will be two storey. A series of documents, including transport notes, active travel audits, and plans proposing off-site highway improvement works on Rinford Road have also been submitted in the support of the application. An ecological walkover report accompanied the original submission, confirming that the site to be of low ecological value, with there being no impact on agriculture, bats, badgers and reptiles. The potential low impact on a number of small commoner birds could be negated through new planting bird boxes. I would draw members' attention to the responses received uh, from the local member and town council. They provide a comprehensive summary of the main objections that have been offered by residents. As with previous schemes, this application has been widely opposed by residents on Minford Road, Minford Close and Pentwin Road. A summary of those objections is set out on pages 26 and 27 of your report. It's important for members to note the policy context for the determination of the application. And again, they're listed in the report on pages 27 and 28. Having considered the submission, the relevant policies, and all the comments that we received, I think the main issues for members to consider today in the determination of the application are as follows. Firstly, the principle of residential development in this location. The site is located within the main settlement of Pencoid. It is a brownfield site. Policy COM3 confirms that residential developments on small sites such as this will be permitted when no other LDP protects the buildings or land for an existing alternative use. The site is not allocated for any other specific use and therefore residential development would be acceptable in principle, subject to the consideration of all other policies within the plan. And that's what needs to be borne in mind is that there's been a history of consents on this particular site. Concerns have been expressed by residents about the lack of infrastructure to support this development, as we often do on housing sites. But given the scale of the, uh, the development being only four units, it does not pass the threshold requiring any contribution to education facilities. And the concerns about the availability of doctors and dentists, as we've advised members, go beyond the scope of our role as a local planning authority and as you as members in determining this application. Members will be mindful of a need for the planning system to promote and support the delivery of active travel. And this has been quite an issue for us in the consideration of the planning application. The lack of continuous footways serving the site has been a subject of discussions and negotiations with the applicant. An active travel walking route assessment has been undertaken in accordance with the active travel guidance. The results of this survey, along with a proposal to improve the connections through new signage and the provision of designated pedestrian zones on Pentwin Road and Med Minford Road has to some extent negated our additional con initial concerns about active travel connections. Based on the audit and high highway improvements that can be secured through the consent, any policy objection to the principle of this site being developed for housing would I be believe difficult, difficult to sustain at appeal. Second issue to consider for members today is the design and layout and how it impacts residents and how it will be acceptable in terms of the future occupiers of the property. Objectors have, suge objectors, sorry, have suggested that the development is completely out of character with its surrounding. This may indeed have been the case for an earlier application uh, that was submitted for 10 units on the site, but has been subsequently redrawn. That included a flatted complex and I think there were good grounds to suggest that wasn't an appropriate response to this particular site. 
The layout before you members follows the general pattern of development in the area with a scale of units similar to those on Minford Road. The area generally has a fairly mixed design of house styles and scales. And I think to suggest it's completely out of character is not really justified. The relationship between the uh, proposed development on existing properties has been examined to the extent that you can do on the basis of this type of application because we don't have the full details before us because they're not required. But I think looking at it as, as, as carefully as we can in terms of the particular relationships with properties, we believe that the, the standards that we apply in terms of privacy, daylighting and domination can be met, but they will be closely scrutinised when we receive a reserved or detailed application in due course, should any decision be to grant this scheme. Turning probably to the most important issue and the one that the public speaker turned most of her attention to was basically highway safety. That covers a number of issues. The adequacy of the network to serve this site have been long standing objections with many residents over many different applications. And we acknowledge that deficiencies in the network do exist and opportunities to improve are limited. Residents suggest that the speed of traffic and parked vehicles creates an unsafe situation, which will only be exacerbated by the development. This is, however, an existing problem and will continue irrespective of this development. The application, however, offers, offers an opportunity for improvements to be made with the provision of designated pedestrian zone, as I referred to earlier. The proposed works will have wider benefits and will improve the existing highway situation. Members should be also mindful that the site development will result in a widening of Minford Road and the provision of a footway along the site frontage, which should assist the movement of pedestrians. Again, existing problems associated with on-street parking cannot be resolved through this application, and the assessment for us is to consider whether sufficient space can be provided to serve this development. At this stage, we don't know what size these dwellings are likely to be because that's not before us. And therefore, the parking requirements are unknown, but they will be tested in due course against the council's parking standards. We believe on the basis of the layout that we see before us that sufficient space could be provided for future owners and occupiers of the property. The future development is likely to see vehicles reversing onto the highway, an arrangement that's been de deemed acceptable in safety terms with adequate vision being available at the respective access, po access points. Despite the development being widely opposed by local residents over the years, one of the benefits of previous consent schemes was the upgrading of a section of Minford Close up to the junction with Minford Road. Such works were entirely reasonable on previous schemes because they all proposed the access on to the close. The close is unmade, members. It's been left in a state of poor repair from well, many, many years ago when the site was actually originally built. The developer never completed the development and the roads have never been finished properly or adopted. The layout submitted with this application as I've said earlier, proposes the access onto Minford Road with only one plot utilised in the unmade highway. Consideration has been given to repeating planning conditions requiring the upgrade of the close on this application, but advice from Welsh Government is pretty clear that it's not for the developer to pay the costs of such highway improvements if they're not directly related to the development. Um, on the basis that the greater part of this proposed development will affect Minford Road, and conditions can be imposed to prevent vehicle access on to Minford Close, the level of improvements required under the previous permissions cannot reasonably sought again. Other considerations for members are the impact on the natural environment, particularly biodiversity and ecology. And I, I, at the introduction, I referenced the survey work that had been done in respect of this application. Our ecologist has looked at that and has sought that we seek what we call ecological enhancements as part of any future development and that conditions have been imposed to deal with that matter. On that basis, we believe the development would be policy compliant. Site drainage, site drainage is not without its challenges, uh, although Duke Cymru Welsh Water have confirmed that capacity exists within the public series network to receive the domestic foul from this development. 
The SUD systems, um, which would be proposed for this development, will have to go through a separate process of agreement with the council. And again, conditions are imposed um, to cover that matter off. Section 106, contributions. Um, members will note that we are seeking contributions towards affordable housing and the improvement of play and recreational facilities within the, within the area. We acknowledge that planning obligations can affect the viability of residential development, but there's been no indication from the applicant that the levels that we're seeking here could not be secured through the agreement. Members, in conclusion, you're often required to consider many issues when de deciding to grant planning permission, the weighing up process it's often called, and it presents its own challenges with this development. The policies of the adopted local plan are your starting point, and there is broad support for the development underused sites such as this for housing. It's not unqualified and the, the development must achieve a high quality design. Um, and we believe ultimately that the layout of this site and the future development can achieve those objectives. Overall, it remains the case that the principle of the site being developed for housing accords with all relevant policies. Although all the active travel links connecting the site to nearby facilities and amenities are not complete, the scheme offers an opportunity for improvements to be made and for signage to be provided. Such work would ensure that a choice of transport modes will be available to existing and future residents. A safer route should encourage walking and cycling to extend to existing public transport facilities and wider amenities. The development of this site has been opposed by many residents for many years, where the key issue has been around highway safety and the impact on living conditions. As set out in the report, there will be impacts resulting from this development, but none that would indicate a fundamental conflict with policy. Conditions will be required to control the interests of safeguarding the living conditions of residents and highway safety. The recommendation before you is to approve subject to conditions, but there will be a requirement for a 106 agreement to be signed before any consent is issued. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Phil. <coughs> Councillor Clark. Thanks, Chair. Uh, th th thanks, Phil. Obviously, we've got the, the planner. Um, I've got no problem with, with the actual development. I think I'm coming from the safety uh, point of view that you spoke about earlier on, and obviously the speaker did as well. Um, I take it that Minfrood Road is on the right of the plan? Correct, Councillor. That, that's Minfrood Road. On the left-hand side is Minfrood Close. Yes, correct. Right, OK. Um, and you, you mentioned that the, the road is going to be um, made up to 1.8 metres. The, the footway will be made up to 1.8 1, metre footway and the actual carriageway width will be widened. If I can, sorry to talk, I, I don't, I, I don't want right. to yes. talk across you. I, um, just, I just want to understand about, you know, is there going to be a pavement? Is the road going to be made up? Because I understand that Minfrood Road is a single track road, is that correct? It, it it's it's narrow in part because what you have you have vehicles parked along the frontage here what right. what i can perhaps help if i just try to zoom in a little bit now the dotted line is basically the extent on at the edge of the road if you remember the public speaker did say that this site has kind of taken its own shape and form over the years because various developers have gone there and played around with it for want of a better word and it's become very overgrown and I would suggest the site has almost come out into the highway. But just looking at that area, just that it shows the existing boundaries of the site as it is. You can see how the actual front boundary will be set back some way from where the edge is currently to allow a new footway. And consequently, there will be a widening of the highway. I think it varies slightly in terms of its width because the frontages of the property is opposite vary as well um you know that that isn't consistent there is some variation with that so yeah the scheme will deliver the footway along the site frontage with a little setback a lay by for plot one <coughs> because plot one has its vehicle access at the back but pedestrian access at the front so if you've had calling visitors uh, calling vehicles visitors they would be able to park within the lay by and just to make the point at the top you've got then the junction into minfield close where they would put a proper curb line in there and obviously surface the first 10 metres of that in hard or permanent surface. It's basically stone at the moment. Thank you, Councillor. 
Right, Th uh, thanks for that. You did mention when you were um, speaking, Phil, that uh, d did you say that the, the vehicles would be able to reverse out onto the road? Did you say reverse? Well, I think certainly from the layout plan we have before us now is that if you were to drive into that property, yes, they would be reversing. Now, it, it, it's a choice, I suppose, at the ultimate, ultimately, if you pull in, you can reverse into your driveway and drive out in the forward gear. I think that's that's preference, preferable right. in terms of the highway code, but yeah, there is some yes. potential the vehicles could reverse out. It's similar to what properties <laughs> do opposite on Minford Close oh. and indeed on Minford Road. Yeah. Oh, that's OK. I mean, obviously, you've mentioned the highway code because I was going to mention that because obviously in the highway code, you should never reverse out onto mm. a main road. But um, I, I was just checking that that's exactly what you said. Um, OK, that's that's fine. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Pratt, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's an interesting. Um, proposal, this one. Um, I think I agree with Councillor Clark. Don't agree with the don't don't disagree with the proposal in principle. Um, I suppose my question really is um, uh, it's along the same lines of pedestrian safety. But if this if we don't approve this 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 um, application today, there are no plans by BCBC to say adopt the roads or improve pedestrian safety. So if if it was rejected today. Um, Minford Close and Minford Road will still be suffering from what I understand from the speaker for a um, a number of years. So um, I, I'm not, I don't know the area well. I wonder whether, um, if, if it's allowable, whether Councillor Alex Williams or, or the speaker um, could, could advise me on how long um, the, the roads and the, the proposed site has been in the state that it is. Um, but yeah, no, it's an interesting situation. Um, so I just some clarification points on that, on whether BCBC are planning to do any kind of improvements if the application isn't approved. And how long has it been in the state that it is? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pratt. John, uh, uh, Phil? Yeah, there's John who wants to speak. Oh, John, do um, you want to speak? Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'm sure Phil may have the answer to that, but we also have um, a highway officer with us, Rob Morgan, as well, who may be able right. to clarify some of those 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 points, Chair. And uh, the, the other reason for my intervention is that I, I forgot to introduce myself at, uh, on the last item. So for the purposes of the video recording, my name is Jonathan Parsons. I'm the Group Manager for Planning and Development Services. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Rob, Rob Morgan, do you want to come in and answer these points about the traffic? For Councillor Pratt, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I can't seem to get my camera on, but for the purposes of the recording, I am the Principal Officer of Highway Development Control. Um, in respect of the, the situation that's there now, as far as I'm aware, that situation has existed for in excess of 25 years. It's definitely been that way since since I started with the authority in 1999 and I've been doing this job since 2004 and it's been there for that time. Minford Close itself is, as Phil has suggested, and adopted uh, and maintained. It is a private situation um, and this developer is setting back the boundaries of his plot uh, on Minford Close itself. Um, to provide for suitable widths, it as Phil has suggested, it's not been made up in terms of its if its bound surface, but but space will exist for vehicles to pass on it. Um, and in respect of Minford Close itself, this development proposes a widening, which as we as an authority would not be able to provide because it's private land. That widening also includes for a setback for a footway. Again, we wouldn't be able to provide that. And in addition, uh, there have been significant negotiations in respect of provision of warning signage and surface treatment on Pentwin Road and Minford Road itself to provide for warning and shared surfaces for pedestrians and vehicles, which, which in our opinion, overcomes existing highway safety concerns um, and and. The whole scheme has been um, considered in, in, in the round with our transport policy section and our traffic management department. 
So we're satisfied with the development subject to the conditions that we've suggested to be imposed. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Councillor, are you happy with that reply? Yes, I'm satisfied. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Councillor Hughes, Della Hughes, please. Oh, hi. Um, again, um, no objection to a, a development on that at site because it sounds like um, it would be an improvement on the area and housing that is needed. But again, my my concern there is is the highways. Um, I understand that um, a previous application, the condition was that Minfrood Close was resurfaced. Um, due to the number of units, etc. But you can, on this application, you know, the first house will be using the close there. Um, and is there any reason why that that the houses, uh, the drives facing Minford Road, why that those uh, um, the drives then couldn't be that side as well? So they're not exited onto the the road, the Minford Road. It's around the back where the close is. Would that be um, another option? And really, would, is there any intention at all that BCBC would upgrade that Minford Close that has been in a bad state of repair since it was there? Is that an option at all, given the fact that there's been a budget for some uh, roads to be adopted? Um, just wondering if that would be a possibility at all in the future. Bill? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Hughes. Yeah, it, it, it's... It's kind of the age old question. If I if chair with your permission, I'm just going to share something on the screen again, if I may. Um, I hopefully the map of the area will come up just, just to give a bit of context from an aerial image. You've got the, as it were, made up carriageway here of Minford Road, and then you've got Minford Close, which, as Councillor Hughes says, has, has been in a poor state of, of disrepair for many years. I think historically this site was just basically a continuation and this is long before my involvement in the council was going to basically a continuation of, of Minford Close. There would have been just a series of bungalows and properties on your, akin to what they've developed elsewhere. But I think and it's a little bit third hand, but I, I think the developer went through, disappeared and never completed the development. So they were in the in history. There's a there's a consent on here for this land long, long gone. But um, and I, 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 I can't recall ever seeing that as to which way those properties were accessing, accessing the development. Historically, uh, Councillor Hughes is right, they did access Minford Close, the unmade section. And we felt that would allow us then to make the developer, not all of Minford Close, make the developer uh, bring up the road to an adoptable standard. Basically, and historically, the schemes would have had all this area you know, properly uh, surface, footways, et cetera, et cetera. Now on the layout, we only have the development, the one plot at the south, and that is quite a significant amount of work to do in terms of surfacing, potentially drainage. And I'm speaking as a planner, not an engineer. Uh, and we have looked and think, don't think that's proportionate now to expect the developer to do that. So that is why we have taken the view saying, the development is now fronting it. That's the decision of the developer to promote the scheme in that way with direct access onto Minford Road. And we've had to consider that accordingly. They, they've they not presented an application with all the units onto Minford Close. The reasons for doing that are their own. Um, it may be to do with cost in terms of the viability of the scheme if they then had to make up that section of road. But I don't have anything before us other than the scheme presenting the access in, in that manner. So. Thank you, Chair. Jonathan, do you want to come in now? Uh, yeah, it's just on the point raised about um, future proposals to to do any work or improvements to that road. I'm I'm not aware um, that there are any. It's, it's not a it's it's not a um, um, a matter for, uh, for for this committee or for the local planning authority. But that there there are um, there is a team within within the council that would 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 look into this. Um, I believe that there is there has been some uh, funding through Welsh Government on the unadopted roads scheme, mm. um, which again is not a matter that's controlled by planning. And I believe the council have put some priorities forward. I'm not quite sure if this is one of them, um, but it's it's we, we don't really know whether if this development doesn't come forward, we don't I don't think that we, we can confirm either way whether this road will be brought up to standard or not. 
Um, but again, just to advise members that we, we have to make a determination based on the the application that is that is before us. Um, but uh, I think I think we certainly can't sort of answer those those questions, unfortunately, at this at this point in uh, in, in time. Thanks. OK, thank you for that. Councillor Griffiths, you got your hand up. Yes. Um, are we able to ask the, the developer himself about why he's made the choice to put the access onto the road rather than under the close? Well. I think the current developer. Um, OK, perhaps just take you through the iteration of this application. The the layout that we were presented with originally on this application, indeed the layout the uh, residents were consulted on, didn't look like this. A very different configuration and one that wasn't particularly acceptable to us. Um, I think what the developer has done is has thought, right, OK, I'll go back through the historical applications. Previously, the council agreed a scheme in 2013 for a layout almost identical to what we have before us today and thought that may be something that would be more acceptable to the council. So that I think possibly is their reasoning, whether there was anything beyond that or behind that. I, I can't say, councillor. I think it's simply a case of saying, well, what were the council prepared to accept historically? That doesn't mean that we're bound to today, but obviously it does set a degree of precedent is the wrong word. It, they probably felt that that had a better chance of success at this stage and perhaps um, any other scheme. So uh, that's all I can say, councillor, is that I think they've really looked at the, as it were, the blueprint of an earlier consent and followed that. Thank you, Chair. Are you happy with that, Simon? Yeah, I, I think all the comments we've had so far are about road safety and about reversing onto the road. Um, my, and otherwise, it looks like a, a, a good development and it, it fixes a lot of problems. And, and I just wondered whether there is an option for us to have another conversation with the developer to say, look, the idea is great. We like it. But actually, for road safety purposes, we, we would prefer it to be on the other side. So can, can we proactively ask the question of the developer whether that's a possibility for them to consider. That 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 is Mr. Carey Griffiths, the applicant then, is it? Yes. I don't know what, what what's your opinion, Phil? Well Jonathan will come in, but I think I think it, it it's again this the the situation of so what's on the table. It, yeah, that's that's precisely it, Chair. This is what's been presented to us. They are actually it's an outline application. Um, and they are looking to agree the means of access to this site. So, yeah, and, and the plan obviously before members is showing the access for three of the properties onto Minford. So, so we, we have we have Mr Griffiths on the call, I understand. Are, are we able to ask him the question? Uh, I, I, again, Chair, we, we've got to be mindful of, of what our protocols are for uh, engagement with public speakers. Yes. Um, we, we do have um, um, a, a a protocol for for uh, how how meetings are conducted that that's that's been circulated to all members, um, and I, again I would I would stress that we we can't be seen to be um, uh, going outside of that protocol because we could be challenged in the future. Um, the, the legal officer may have a view on this, but um, I think again what I refer back to what Phil has said is what we we are considering what is actually on the table. We we. We can't actually amend that scheme at the moment and yeah. determine it because it would require uh, further consultation. Thank you, Jonathan. Jane, is that correct? Yes, Chair, I'd, I'd agree with um, Jonathan's comments there. Um, I think the the application is the one um, before committee today. Um, and to, to invite the applicant back in would be going outside of protocol um, that we have in place. OK, thank you very much for that. Well, Simon, you've heard what the legal officer said, so we can't do that. So we have to do this on its merits, the what's in front of us. Are you happy I, with that? I, I, I am. I am happy with that and I understand the protocol. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is to get to the best possible outcome for the development yes. and for the, the amenity the of, of the area. And so what I'm, I guess what I'm asking officers are is if we were to OK this, as, as an outline application, whether they could have an active conversation with the developer to say, are there some options we can take which actually alleviate some of the concerns that were raised in the Developer Control Committee um, around around road and traffic safety? So I, 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 as, as I'm not asking 
did we refuse this or even that we amended in any way, but simply that we have an ongoing active conversation, which I'm sure you guys will have anyway. Jonathan, do you want to answer that, please? Uh, yes, sir, we, we, can, we can operate within the bounds of the planning system and, 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 and within the bounds of any consent that is issued. And, and just to sort of clarify, I think what, what um, go back to the, 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 the council's other point is, yes, I understand, I can see the, the merits in, in trying to sort of progress matters, but that that's a matter that, that we can't really take through through this committee process at the moment. It, it it's perfectly acceptable perhaps for the the um the applicant or his agent to point out matters of fact or detail, but what we were asked what we'd be asking is to is, is to is, is to change a scheme then which we, we would then necessitate a a further consideration in planning terms and further consultations a little bit step too far. So I just want to make that distinction between um what we can and what we, we we can't do, but we can certainly take on board those comments. And if and if consent is issued, we will we can we we as as Phil has said, it is um it is an outline application. We we could um we can can look at that again at the reserve matters stage. Thank you, Jonathan. Are you happy with that, Simon? Yes, thank you very much, Jonathan. That's that's very reasonable. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Then, Councillor Williams, Martin Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Just a, just a quick one. And again, I don't have any particular issue with it, with the, the development per se. Um, just an observation. There's there's uh, just over four thousand uh, pound section one or six uh, money proposed for um, play space, outdoor sports facilities. Um, where would that be spent? Because it's not obvious to me where, where any play area in in the in the near vicinity and and you know i i don't know the area but a quick look at, at google street map suggests that you know minfrew road in particular is is a dangerous road there's no safe walking route there so it could well be that the the developer is is contributing to to facilities that the residents may never able to be used safely yes. uh would it be would it be preferable for a se section 106 contribution to go towards some means of, of of road safety improvement, whether those are signs or or, or, or white lines or, or or something like that, would that be a, a better use of the money? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, excellent question. Possibly I can take the second part of that question first, if I may, and with your permission again, Chair. Can I can I just share a couple of drawings? It's just to deal mm. with um, the second point that Councillor Williams said. Bear with me. OK, um, I think myself and, 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 and Rob Morgan have referenced this, these highway improvement works that are, I'll call it off site because they're not, they're, they're in Minford Road, the junction of Pentwin Road. I'm hoping there's a plan appearing on your screen at the moment. It is. Members, it is so. um, what you'll see, just, just, just to make a point here, you're seeing a layout on the site that's not the layout before you. I, I just, I think I referred to in, in answer to Councillor Griffiths about an earlier iter iteration. That isn't before you members, but what you can see here are a series of works, signage works and surfacing works, um, what they call street print or a similar surface. I think the idea of this, and perhaps Rob may be able to answer a little bit more than I and a bit more knowledge is, it's made it's meant to make the error calmer in a sense that it 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 gives the impression to drivers that there's a different surface, there's something different happening, and speeds will be slowed down. Plus, there will be signage, and there's a further plan further down where Minford Road joins. If I got my geography, Pembrist Road here. Similar arrangement here. What you've got here, members, is the areas where there are no footways. As I said, it's quite an old part of Pencoid. Actually, there's there's more modern development off it, but members may recall historically Minford Road went right the way through right the way through into the countryside but it was stopped off when they did the the, the northern bypass to Pankard many years ago so the footways have been they're, they're missing here but the opportunity is again is to calm the road down and 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 sort of speed in terms of the the the, the question about where the monies will be spent i have to say in terms of a similar assessment that done i think there are facilities to the south east of this application play facilities and there's some areas within the school that to my knowledge council is is the closest there aren't many play facilities immediately in the locale of this development to be honest with you but it would be facilities within this part of Pencott. it would be a little point of sort of getting facilities money here to go to facilities at the sort of southern end of Pencott. but 
it's it's money that we've looked to secure as we would do with you know uh, standard obligations for developments of sites and and just quickly looking on this map again just to remind myself where there are further areas i think there are areas in, in as i said to the southeast of the development site yes it would mean that people living on this development as existing residents have to do is walk to access those facilities where those facilities exist the monies then could be used to improve those facilities um thank you chair thank you phil rob do you want to just come in and, and quantify what, what phil has just said so we're yeah. answering all the points yes i can chair um in in all honesty phil has dealt with it <laughs> adequately but i would reiterate that uh, as i said earlier that those off-site highway improvements have been considered internally with our transport policy people and our transport traffic management department. They were supported by an active travel audit. Um, they are conditioned by condition 11 on your report. Yeah. And and we, we do feel that those would um, raise awareness of drivers of of the need for pedestrians to be in the carriageway in those localized areas and will provide a warning and um, mitigate not only the pedestrians attracted by the development itself but obviously existing pedestrians okay thank you for that um councillor clark you got your hand up Thank you, Chair. Um, just quickly, there was a mention of uh, Section 106 monies. I was just wondering, will Pencoy Town Council be um, given that information? Because obviously, you know, uh, the councillors there will know the area and if they need to access it when the development goes ahead, then perhaps they can. So I'm not quite sure whether they are notified. Thank you. Bill? Thank, thank you, Chair. Um... <sighs> My understanding that that's a negotiation that takes place between us and the developers in terms of the sums of money. I know now, you know, there's been areas of open space and play areas have been passed off to to other bodies and councils. I think initially that the negotiations to secure that monies would be between the developers and the council. Uh, any any arrangements beyond that? Um, might possibly if Jonathan maybe answer that question. Can I just go back to something Councillor Williams asked about the location? Um, I did I did identify, I said somewhere to the southeast of the site, which is a little bit vague. I apologise for that. Can I just share a plan again, Chair, if that's OK? Yes, just very yes. quickly. Um, it, it, it's it's OS base. Um, bear with members. Try not to get you busy by dragging the map, but the site is. On technology work, the site is just a little bit further up here. This is the nearest play area facility here. So I think there's an opportunity. It, it, it serves this community. There's an opportunity for this, those, these monies that we would secure to look to improve facilities there, you know, maintenance, upgrade the equipment. That I think is, is, is the closest play facility uh, um, for people that would live in this area to use. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, but as one more speaker, I'm just going to ask him because he did indicate, Councillor Hayes, you did look it to indicate if you wanted to speak, Martin. Do you have you got a question? I'm going to give you the opportunity no, to come no, in now. Hands back, hands back down, um, Chair. The section one and six um, queries have been addressed. Thanks. Okay, that's fine. I just don't want to miss anybody out. Okay, so everybody, uh, nobody else got any questions. No, OK, I can't say anybody answering. Are we all in favour of this application? I'm in favour, Chair. Uh, Agreed. Yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. Yeah, in favour. Right, Aye. thank you. Thank you for that. Jane, have you got that? I think that was passed. Yes. Yeah, so how many? Let's check now. Nobody disagreed with the recommendation, was there? No. No. Yes, that's no. passed, yes. yes. Yes, okay, fine. Just just uh, double checking. Right, if we go on to uh item number 10, then 28 pant glass pen cord. There is a, a speaker, uh, and Mr. D. Reese has confirmed. Uh Mr. Reese, 
it will speaking first, Craig. Yeah. Ma, um, can we put him? Go on, Craig. Sorry, Chair. Uh, shall I explain the uh, relationship between this application and the following one? The following application before um, the speaker. Uh, it's if only you want to, yeah, just highlight it to members, yeah. yes. It's only a brief uh, statement. Uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, my name is Craig Flower and I'm the Minor Applications Team Leader. Uh, I will be presenting this item 9 relating to 26 pant glass and also item 10 relating to 28 pant glass. Uh, both applications are related in that they both propose uh, a rear storage building. Uh, this will be constructed on each of the rear gardens as one building. Uh, but with a dividing wall down the middle. This is shown on the site layout plan on page 45 of the report. Uh, the parents live at number 26 Pant Glass and the son lives at 28. Uh, as they separate applications, they will be uh, presented separately. Uh, so I just so I just mentioned that before uh, the speaker um, right. begins. Uh, okay. I just start the uh, the clock now. OK, thank you. Is he there to speak? Mr. Mr. Reese, are you there? I am, yes. Can you hear me? OK, thank you for that. You've got five minutes, Mr. Reese. It'll start when you start speaking. OK, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, members of the committee, for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Uh, I must apologise. I'm currently on holiday in Tenerife, so I'm a bit limited to what uh, notes I've got because everything's back at my house in, uh, in Wales. Um, but basically, uh, as Craig has just uh, mentioned, uh, the applications are covering for two applications, for which is uh, 26 and 28, uh, which we are objecting to uh, for both applications. Um, I'm obviously speaking today on behalf of myself and my wife at number 30 Pound Glass. Um, I am aware of other residents in the area, uh, four or five res other residents in Pound Glass and some houses to the other side of uh, Glen Amell who are objecting. I obviously don't know if they have objected because obviously I'm not privy to that information, but they have informed me that they have written to the council with their objections as well. Um, but basically both applications I feel uh, come into three parts. The first one is the construction of the garage slash store to the rear of the property. The second um, part is the carport to the side of number 28 and then the garage store to the side of number 26. And the third part is the increased level of the garden. So I'll deal with them uh, in that order. First of all, uh, our objections to the construction of the garage store uh, at the rear of both properties. Um, I think these plans have been amended down slightly from the first ones. They were originally nine meters across by eight meters in depth per property. They have been scaled back slightly to um, six meters in depth and eight meters across. But obviously, as this is two applications uh, adjoining each other's, in total, this uh, storage garden garage is approximately in total 60 metres by 12 metres, sorry, 60 metres by tw uh, 6 metres back. So we feel that this is not a domestic um, building that's being installed. We, we have concerns that the applicant will be using it more for commercial use. And I think by the size of that, that he's applying for, that uh, that gives us the concerns there that, that it will be eventually used for commercial uh, property. It also is worth noting that with the garage at the rear of the garden, they are looking to impose a carport on the side of uh, the property and another garage on the side. So obviously, given the fact is that they've got a large storage at the rear of the garden, plus uh, two other uh, garages, carports and stores to the side of each property, there's a lot of garage uh, and storage space that's um, being applied for for here. Our, our main concern is that if this is passed, uh, the unit to the rear of the garden, yes, there is a wall, I believe, in the application that is dividing uh, both units, um, but we fear that that will be uh, knocked down at some point and it creates one big super unit at the back of the garden. There is no access to the storage for number 26, because um, obviously there's an existing dwelling there. So therefore we think that it's going to become a shared driveway down the garden from number 28 and um, then access for both don't be used. I have uh, mentioned in my uh, objections to the council that uh, there are TPOs in close proximity uh, and we're currently awaiting a report from a local arboriculturist to come back and give us uh, his findings on that because we feel that if this goes ahead uh, this might damage the trees with the TPOs on that vicinity. Um, 
one of the things that another thing that we're objecting about is the noise. You know, they've got this two roller shutter doors to the rear store and a further two uh, roller shutter doors to the carport. So therefore, there's four roller shutter doors in total, which is quite a lot of uh, roller shutter doors. And again, this has quite noise indication. Um, go into the carport. Um, the car park on the side of the property is, will be connected to the storage to the, the side of 26. So again, we feel that it's just one large garage uh, across the two properties. And again, you know, it, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of garage and storage being made on this application. Uh, the final part is raising the garden uh, by I think it's 350 mils or 35 centimeters. Uh, I'd like to query if this is if this application has come through. Um, enforcement or application because the application uh, the applicant for number 28 has already raised the garden in parts um, so we don't actually know where the level this garden is going to be because um, he's already put quite a bit of infill there um, we've had quite a lot of floodings in our garden in number 30 uh, issues that um, councillor Alex Williams has been involved with and Welsh water and we feel that um, with the garden being raised our um, a property our garden will be further flooded again and this will bring back a recurring issue um but i say i'd like to um thank you for your time and uh for giving me the opportunity to speak thank you thank you mr reese okay craig oh sorry craig before you start council richard williams you got your hand up do apologize thank you chair it was just to record before craig's oh opening remarks that I had re rejoined the meeting for the purposes of the recording. OK, thank you sorry. very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Right. OK, Craig. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I just share my screen, I've created a, a presentation. Uh, let's see. OK, so this um, so application P22335 for, for 26 plant glass proposes a rear storage building plus a single storey uh, garage store to the side of the dwelling. Um, so slide two. On the screen, we can see the originally submitted plans for the rear storage building. Mm. Uh, well, the half of it that would be located within the rear garden of number 26 plant glass. Uh, the building was proposed to be nine metres wide and eight metres in depth. The sloping roof would be 2.5 metres uh, at the front, uh, sloping upwards to the rear, uh, which would have been four metres. Uh, amended plans were requested to reduce the scale of the building, and these are shown in the next slide. So the proposed uh, storage building has now been reduced from nine metres wide down to eight metres. Uh, the depth reduced from eight metres down to six metres. Uh, and the height of the rear bit of the building reduced from four metres down to three metres. Uh, the, build, the building is now similar in size uh, to a, a usual double garage. Uh, there are no side or uh, rear facing windows serving the, uh, the proposed uh, storage building, and so there will be no impact from this uh, on the privacy of neighbouring properties. Uh, this slide shows the uh, the uh, elevations of the garage store to the side of the dwelling. Uh, this is modest in size and has not been amended from uh, what was originally submitted. Uh, the garage is not sufficient in size, internal size rather, to uh, accommodate uh, a vehicle. So I, I would assume it's just used for storage. Uh, there's enough space on the, the front forecourt area to accommodate uh, three cars. So we consider that's enough space uh, at the front there uh, for the uh, the property, which I think is a three bed. Um, so the next slide shows the comments, uh, sorry, the comments and objections received uh, are shown on the report on pages 41 and 42. And our officer comments on these objections are shown on pages 42 and 43. Uh, this slide shows the most common objections uh, that several neighbours have, uh, have provided. Uh, so you've got the, the size of the proposed rear storage building. Uh, this has been reduced in size from what the original proposal was. Uh, like I said earlier, it's similar in size now to a, uh, a double garage. Mm. Um, so the next comment, uh, potential use of uh, the storage building for commercial purposes. 
Uh, the application has been submitted on the householder application form and does not mention any commercial repair of vehicles at all. Uh, not in any, uh, not on the form or not any, uh, uh, sorry, on the submitted plans. Uh, we've added a condition two to ensure the use of the proposed uh, rear storage building plus the side garage remains as domestic only with no commercial activity. Uh, we've received no recent enforcement complaints alleging the car repair business, specifically at uh, number 26 Pant Glass. Um, the other main concern was about noise and smoke from uh, existing activities. Um, these, like it says, these are uh, activities, activities that are going on at the moment, uh, not as a result of uh, this application uh, and any issues regarding noise or smoke nuisance. Uh, investigated by shared, shared regulatory services. Mm. Um, we've uh, rec also recommended a, a condition be added requesting how surface water will be dealt with um, and these details will need to be provided and agreed by the local planning authority before any building works commence. Uh, in conclusion, the proposal complies with the council policy and guidelines. It is considered it would not have an adverse impact on the visual amenities of the locality or on the street scene. Condition two would ensure the use remains as domestic. Uh, and uh, the concerns raised by uh, the neighbours and uh, the speaker earlier uh, are acknowledged. However, on balance, it's considered that they do not outweigh the other material issues connected to this development so as to warrant refusal on those grounds. Um, I think I've covered most of the objections uh, mentioned by the um, the speaker. Um, the raising of the ground, the, uh, the ground levels is related to the subsequent application, so I'll speak about that uh, at that point. Um, not noise uh, from the roller shutters has been mentioned as well. Um, the uh, agent has confirmed the roller shutters would be electrically operated, um, which is uh, standard for a, a domestic property, rather than like uh, the commercial unit where you pull them down and they make uh, a, a bit of noise. Um, so that should uh, take, um, sh so that should address that concern. Um, I think that's about it. So uh, thank you, Chair, and I just look forward to any uh, questions. There you are. Thank, thank you, Craig. Is anybody there? Oh, yeah. Councillor Clark. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, if I could just query, because I know um, Craig mentioned it more than once, that it resembles a double garage, but I'm not getting that impression from slide four. Or am I um, not seeing it properly? Slide four that you put up, Craig? Uh, slide four, this one? No, that's... Uh... That, I mean, you know, oh. if that... Right. This one? No, no, slide four. If you go back to slide four. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and okay. we're talking, and and you were talking on number twenty six. Twenty six. Yes. So which is twenty? Which is twenty six? Uh, this uh, this is this property here is twenty six pant glass. Um, right. Not only does it include the proposal for a, a side building for a store, it also includes the uh, the rear larger storage building. This one here. Right, so that's that's the one that looks like a double garage. Is that what that's you're telling right. me? Yes. So ah, right. The, okay. The uh, the subsequent application um, uh, is the other half of this, which is basically mirrored on this side. Yeah, I so understand. So you've got the roller shutter door here as well. Oh, um, oh but right. But they would be separated by um, a, a central wall. Right. Um, so the the slide number four is the carport. Is it? Uh, no, this is the um, the front uh, garage slash store. Um, the carport is for this subsequent application on item 10. Oh, right. Um, OK. So uh, this is just for a, a, Right. Yeah. It was just when I saw that plan and you were talking about a double garage, I thought it doesn't look like a double garage to me. No, it's a bit right. small for that. <laughs> OK, I understand now. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Harrison, please. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, um, no commercial use. Um, how will, if it develops to, it is being used for commercial use, how will this be enforced? Um, any complaints about uh, uh, a commercial use of the property would be dealt with by the uh, enforcement uh, officer. 
Uh, we've had no complaints about uh, commercial use for this particular property, number 26, uh, for, for the last uh, several years. Um, so if the uh, if a complaint was received, we'd investigate it. And obviously, if uh, found to be in breach of the condition two, then we could take uh, the relevant action. That's lovely. Thank you for answering that one. Uh, my second question, Chair, is um, the uh, side garage for one, uh, the, the building that is uh, requested for the side of the houses on 26 and 28. Uh, have they, what sort of entrance will they have at the rear or is it going to be a, an enclosed um, rear of a garage? The, the garage to the side or garage or store to the side of the building uh, would just have the front uh, entrance, no entrance to the side uh, or to the rear. So it's just an enclosed uh, space. Uh, like That's I said, right. it's, it's not sufficient in size, internal size to accommodate a car. You could get a car in there, but you wouldn't be able to get out of it. So it's not much <laughs> use for that. <laughs> like most modern garages. That's lovely. Thank you, Chair and uh, everybody else. Thank you. Councillor Pratt, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just um, may, may need a little bit of latitude. Um, it, obviously, there's been concerns about um, um, commercial works going on on the property, or but nothing has been formally proposed. Is the council aware that in the past that um, a, a business of any type has been operated from this property, whether that would have been legal at the time? Um, I you see where I'm coming on this one. It, it, it's sort of um, it, it's I, I'm concerned that objections have been raised and whether they're uh, it, it's a blind objection in the hope that we listen to it or there has been some evidence of 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 a commercial operation existing in the past. So I just wonder whether there was any clarification on that. Greg, could you answer that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, the latest app, latest complaint about uh, an authorised car repair business at the number 26 Pant Glass was made in 1996. Uh, a complaint was received and investigated, and it was found um, that there was no further action required. I'm not sure of the uh, specifics, but um, uh, the outcome was that um, no uh, car business was being undertaken at the property to warrant any action by uh, the department. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. OK, thank you for that, Councillor Pratt. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I want to speak to you actually not about this application, uh, oddly enough, which I, I'm fine with, um, but I've had a message from Councillor Heidi Bennett, who is uh, speaking or was speaking to you in Mallorca, and she sent me a message by mistake, as we are both Richards, uh, that her allocated Wi-Fi has run out and that she's had to leave the meeting. So that's a, a rather an unusual one, but I thought I'd pass the message on so that uh, to, to, for clarification, OK? OK, thank you very much for that kind of information and it will be noted in the minutes. Has anybody got any other questions for Craig on, on this application? Number 26, Pant Glass. Are we all in favour of the application? Yes, I agree. Yes. In yes. favour, Yes, no in favour. Okay. Any, anybody against? No? Okay, thank you. That's passed then. Right, if we go on to item 10, again, uh, could somebody move the officer's recommendation, please? I move it, Richard. Can somebody second it, please? I'll second it. Thank you. OK, we've now got the, the same speaker, Mr. Reese, again. Uh, if you'd like to come back in, please. Mark, have you got, have you got, or oh, Craig? Mr. Reese, you've got another five minutes to speak now on number 28, Pant Glass. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't feel I need to add any more. Sorry, forgive me, but I thought that we were discussing the both applicants at the same time. So when I initially spoke, it wasn't just about 26, it was about 28, because I took it as a 
joint well, application. So therefore, I'd only be repeating myself because the carport is in fact for 28, not 26. So therefore, I don't feel it would benefit the committee if I reiterated what I've already said. Jonathan, is that is that OK to do that? Uh, certainly, Chair. I, I, I was just going to clarify whether whether Mr. Reese did actually want to speak again if um, <laughs> he didn't feel it was necessary. But th thank you for, for for clarifying that, Mr. Reese. If you if you, do, if you were entitled to a, an additional five minutes, but if you don't, if you feel like you've covered the points in the in your earlier um, uh, public speaking um, slot, then that's fine by us. There's no problem at all. Okay. okay. Thank you, thank thank you Mr. Reese. Thank you, Craig. Do you want to? Uh, Put it to members then, please. OK, um, so this report is very similar to the previous item on the agenda. Uh, if I can share my screen again. Um, not that one. Uh, this one here. Okay. So um, this application is item 10 P22337 full relating to 28 pound glass pencoid. Uh, the proposal involves uh, a re-storage building carport to the side of the dwelling and an increase in levels to the garden area. Um, so on the screen, you can see the originally submitted plans for the rear storage building. Uh, so, so this half would be situated in the rear garden of number 28 pant glass. Um, the, um, as I mentioned earlier, the building was proposed to be nine metres wide, eight metres deep, with uh, a slope and roof 2.5 metres at the front and four metres at the rear. Um, again, we received um, amended plans. Uh, which you received, um, which shows the reduction in the size of the um, proposed rear storage building. Um, and next slide. Um, so this is the uh, the carport proposed to the side of number 28 plant glass. Um, you've got a roller shutter door on the front again um, with a, a, a roof and the, the rear of it is um, open. Um, of course, so on the previous application, we saw a garage to the side, which would be right next to this. Yeah, serving number 26 pan glass. Um, so I think the purpose of this carport, I think, is to pr provide privacy for um, users of the rear garden of the property, uh, as if there was nothing there. Obviously, you could see straight through it down to the rear garden, and it's a profile, so provides uh, some security as well. Um, so the roller shutter door to go up, you drive through the uh, the open rear rear part of it down the uh, the driveway to this to the rear storage building. Um, if number twenty six pant glass wanted to park their vehicle in the rear storage building that we've just approved, um, obviously they'd have to go through this property. Um, down the drive and into the half of the garden, the half of the, uh, the store, um, which is fine at the moment. Like I said, the parents live at 26 and the son lives at 28. So if either of those uh, uh, people left the property, then I, I guess the, uh, the situation would change and there'd be no further access in, uh, in through this, um, the, through the carport to the storage building. Um, the uh, the carport is um, uh, modest in size again and hasn't been changed from the original submission. Again, the um, <clears throat> sorry, the comments and objections received on pages four, 51 and 52 of the report and our officer comments on these objections are shown on pages 52 and 53. Again, the same issues uh, that were raised in the previous application are raised again with this one uh, with regards to the size of the proposed rear storage building. Again, it's been uh, reduced in size to what was approved, sorry, what to what was submitted originally. Uh, again, the use of um, the storage building for commercial car repairs. Um, we propose a condition to uh, on this um, application to prevent any commercial activity in the garage. Um, and again, smoke, uh, noise and smoke from the existing activities, um, which are investigated by uh, shade, re shade regulatory services, uh, sometimes in conjunction with the planning department, if there's an issue about uh, any um, uh, unlawful use of the, uh, the property. Um, we have received um, 
uh, recent enforcement complaints about um, a, uh, a car repair business at 28 Pant Glass, in addition to uh, a complaint relating to the raising of the, um, the rear ground levels of the property, which the speaker mentioned, um, and also about the, uh, the removal of uh, protected TPO trees at the rear. Um, with regards to the complaint about the car repair business, uh, we have in uh, this is ongoing and um, we are investigating the uh, the issue um, but there's been no outcome at the moment um, so with regards to the increase in levels to the rear garden or the rear driveway um, no enforcement is being taken at the moment depending on the outcome of this um, planning application which seeks to uh, retain well retain the levels and uh, increase the size of the garden sorry the increase the level of the the rear garden by 30 centimeters which in fact is um, considered to be permitted development and not requiring planning permission uh, this was reduced um, in height from what was originally um, applied for on the original plans um, we have requested um, we have suggested a, a condition asking for existing and proposed levels uh, to be agreed in advance of any further works commencing. Um, and I, if the, the the driveway is considered to be uh, too high, then we can we'll get that uh, we'll ask to, for that to be lowered in height, um, so it's more appropriate. But we'll consider all this once the um, once we receive the actual details. Um, with regards to the, um, the tree uh, complaint um, that was investigated as well, um, I believe um, there was no outcome of that at the moment. Um, it, de it, de well, it depends what trees were removed and whether they were in fact um, protected trees or are the protected trees still in existence? Uh, we're still um, looking at that issue at the moment. Um, so, let's see. So, in conclusion, again, the uh, the proposed development would comply with the council's policy and guidelines. It was considered not to have an adverse impact on the visual amenities of the locality or on the street scene. Condition two would ensure the use remains as domestic. Um, the concerns raised by the neighbours and the speaker are acknowledged, but on balance, um, they do not consider we do not consider them so material as to warrant refusal of the scheme. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Craig. I, I, okay, Jane, can somebody formally move the officer's recommendation and, and second it, please? I move, Chair. Thank you. I second it, Richard. Thank you. Is that okay, Jane? Okay, Councillor Pratt, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, fine. Um, our, our procedure is amusing, but um, so no evidence at twenty six, but um, commercial use currently being investigated at <laughs> number twenty eight. Um, we are where we are, I suppose. Um, is it possible to, um, if we are minded to approve this, that 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 um, that that the uh, the approval is pending this enforcement investigation. Can I get clarification on that? Because what I don't want to happen is this the, 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 this committee to inadvertently support um, a commercial use of a property um, blindly, um, if that makes sense. So I was just asking for from a legal point or a planning point whether yes, we're happy with the conditions that no commercial use will take place um but as there is currently an investigation going on um regarding commercial use of the property could we suspend um approval determined at the end of that, that that investigation thank you i'm sure jonathan is itching to answer that question i wouldn't go as far as i'm itching to answer it but hopefully i provide <laughs> clarity i, I I, I, no, in in essence, no. I don't. I, we, we can't do that. We we have to determine the application as submitted. Absolutely. The enforcement investigation is a separate matter. Um, at the moment, I'm not aware, unless Roger wants to clarify if there's an update on that enforcement position. I'm not aware that there is any any evidence of commercial activity. 
um, at, at either of the, the these two properties. Um, and, and, I, and again, I think that some of, some of the issues that have been raised are perhaps matters of not planning if there's noise, disturbance, etc. That's that's a that's a, another um, sure. another service would actually deal with that. So no, we, we we have to determine the application that that is in, in in front of us. If, however, it is subsequently found that there is a um, that that there is a commercial activity, then we can we can take enforcement action against it. It doesn't change the what we've granted planning consent for. And by granting this planning consent, it's not granting them a commercial um, use of the premises. It's 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 a domestic use. That's 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 what the the um, the application is for. And it, we wouldn't it wouldn't be giving them any sort of consent at all to to carry on any commercial activities. I, I hope that sort of clarifies the point. But uh, Rodri may want to come in on on, Rod, on some of that. Yes, on the point of the enforcement investigation, we've gone back to uh, the objector or the complainant to ask for them to carry out a log of any activity uh, that they deem to be commercial in that premises, and we've received nothing back. And ironically, uh, by actually approving this application and putting on that condition, it puts us in a stronger footing to actually take enforcement action in the future if it was found to be a commercial development there. So in a in a strange way, uh, rather than uh, holding the decision in abeyance, it's probably better to approve this with this strong condition to limit the commercial uh, entity or possibility of being used for commercial uh, activities in the future, which will give us a bit more uh, strength to our elbow to uh, enforce against in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rodri. Are you happy with that, Councillor Pratt? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Well, look, I'm just conscious of not of the time, but it's moving on. Uh, are we all in favour of this application? Yes. 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 Yes, yes. yes Chair. <clears throat> okay. Is there anybody against? No, that's carried. Thank you all for that. If we can move on to uh, agenda item number 11. Jonathan, do you want to go through the appeals, please? Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Mindful of the time, as you, as you say, um, there's one appeal decision that has come back since the last uh, committee meeting. That's for an agricultural track in, in Shut. Um, the, the appeal was was against the, um, uh, the uh, it's partly been implemented. Um, and the, the 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 reason for refusal concerned uh, e e impact on ecology, uh, visual impact, and highway safety. Uh, and in this case, the the inspector agreed with it with the 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 officer's um, uh, reasons for refusal and um, dismissed the appeal. So it's a matter for the authority now to pursue in enforcement action on that. Happy to take any questions on that. Otherwise, um, happy to move on, Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Have you got any quick questions for Jonathan on, on the appeals? Nobody's indicated. OK, thank you very much, members. We're going to item number 12 then, training log again, Jonathan. Um, thank, thank you, Chair. Just um, a, a few few items I need to pick up on on this particular um, uh, item on the agenda. Uh, we had, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend, but there was a workshop session yesterday on the um, the supplementary planning guidance, which I, I hope members uh, found found useful, um, and uh, it's part of the part of the problem of developing supplementary planning guidance is that we we have member input into it, uh, and help, uh, members help shape that policy, and um, we we then take take on board what what what's been what's been discussed and and um, take it forward then and put it into a into a document form. So the next stage will be to first to bring it back to um, committee in a in a more of a completed um, state, and then we we go to consultation and eventually we 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 have to have it ratified at council if we want to take it forward as as formal planning advice. Once it's got that ratification, it it carries a a lot of weight. So again, thanks to the members that did attend, and I apologise that I, I I wasn't there to um uh, to to take part in that. Um, for the next training session. Uh, which is in November, we have managed to um, secure uh, a session by the Chief Planning Inspector for, for Wales, um, Victoria Robinson. Um, she, she works for the organisation, it used to be known as Planning Inspector, but it's now known as PEDU, which is Planning Decisions Wales. 
and uh, the, the, the Vicky will be giving us an insight into the work of the inspectorate and what the planning inspectors do. Now, planning inspectors deal with um, planning appeals, so where, where an appeal is made against the authorities decision, then they will appoint a planning inspector, but they also deal with rights of way matters, 